So, schönen Nachmittag. Ah ja, schönen Nachmittag im großen Konferenzsaal der Good Post afternoon. City. Welcome to the Conference Hall of Post City aus Electronica 2019. 40 years aus Electronica. As befits festival conferences, we are behind schedule. We should have started 10 minutes ago with the Ars Electronica History Summit. You will have noticed that we are speaking German. If you can't understand what I'm saying, please get hold of a, a headset and receiver. There is simultaneous interpretation from German into English. You want to understand us and you don't have to train your German. Jeder, der lieber Englisch hört, bitte nutzen Sie die letzte Gelegenheit. So, make use of the opportunity of getting a receiver and a headset so that you can receive the simultaneous interpretation. Our interpreters are probably the only ones in this large group who have been translating every one of the 40 symposia that we had over time. And Gerfried is kind enough to say that the interpreters have become something like experts, which we are not, of course, but thanks very much. Okay, uh, one of your interpreters also worked for the uh, transmission of the Apollo 11 moon landing. So, 1969, the Apollo moon landing, and there were a number of laboratories on the U.S. West Coast where an interesting experiment took place, linking computers located in different buildings via a joint network. That was the path of the development that we've been witnessing so far. More, more than four million people are connected, 5.2 million mobile phones are being used, 2.34 billion people use the same social media, Facebook, which actually is controlled by one single person, like the Catholic Church. 54 billion Facebook users. We have 2.2 billion Christians on the planet by way of comparison. And if we count only those who go to church once a month, the number would be even smaller. So what does this mean? In the 50 years, and also during the last 40 years, since the end of 1979, a colonization of digital space actually took place. Apple II and other pieces of equipment were put on the market in 1981. The personal computer is launched on the market. And individualization, a phenomenon showing that digital technology is not only used in laboratories and in the industry, but has become part of our lives. So that was the time when things started and when a number of people unexpectedly got together 
in Linz, at that time the dirtiest town in Austria, an industrial city, a steel city, and they founded Ars Electronica. They not only achieved what people expected in an industrial city, a symposium, an exhibition on electronics, on technology. It was not a strictly academic conference either, rather a festival for art, technology and society. Two of the founding fathers, and there were four founding fathers actually, who started Ars Electronica. Two of them are here, Hannes Leopold Seder and Herbert W. Franke. A cordial welcome to these two gentlemen. I'm very happy that you have found the time to come here. As I said, this is a festival about the people, the men who started it, and the women who observed these developments. So, I will not actually start with Hannes or Herbert. Rather, I'd like to put the first question to Christine. How was Linz in 1979 when these men said, we need Ars Electronica? Well, as you mentioned by way of introduction, uh, Linz was an industrial city. Quite correct. There was the Bruckner Festival, which took place once a year. But I think it should be mentioned that there was a very lively young scene, a group, a community that actually participated in issues uh, concerning the development of the city and that focused on technology. I myself have a background in literature. I did didn't understand anything about computers. But when Hannes Leopold came up with the idea, I was fascinated by the fact that this was something that gave access to everyone to technology. This was something I found fascinating. It was a means for artists to do something Computers were viewed as a tool at that time. Things have changed. I learned a great deal, particularly from Herbert W. Franke. I remember discussions at that time which were really enlightening and inspiring. So gradually I sort of grew into Ars Electronica. I was uh, I had the honor of uh, being responsible for the first publication. Other publications followed. I then became the curator for several projects. And, uh, well, Ars Electronica became a part of me, so to speak. Well, we have about 30 minutes to talk about the founding myth of Ars Electronica. It's a sensational story. From today's perspective, when we think about people 40 years ago, realized that the strongest transforming power of the computer was not the industrial revolution, but rather the cultural, the social revolution. Well, probably this is also due to the fact that Hannes uh, was not a computer scientist, rather he was a journalist, he had studied German literature. So Hannes, may I put the question to you now, what did you think about at that time? What was the idea at that time? Well, I really don't know exactly what I was thinking about at that time. Well, 40 years have gone by. And the fundamental idea underlying the initiative uh, that I uh, launched together with others, Herbert Franke Bogenmeier, a musician, he was one of the initiators. So the essential aspect or point at that time was that I wanted 
to reflect on what would follow iron and steel in Linz. Linz was a steel city. Today, the image of Linz is completely different. Among other things, as a result of Haas Electronica, the AEC, the museum. And I think this was the decisive uh, element of that step, focusing on computer technology and the social impact. Of course, there were a number of discussions, but the decisive element was to think ahead, to look into the future. At that time, we didn't speak of the digital world, but the idea was how would a digital uh, world change society? We saw that year after year. Artificial intelligence, that came very early. Peter Weibel, then uh, already yeah, focused on artificial intelligence. This is something that we tend to forget. Some people believe that it's only now that the era of artificial intelligence has started. This is not true. So the basic idea was art and technology and society. I thought about what would be a possible approach. And uh, well, I was thinking about the Linz sound cloud, the Klangwolke, some of whom may know about it. This was a cultural, political approach, culture for everyone. So Walter Haupt actually started the sound cloud. That was the opening project of the first Ars Electronic. Electronica, a robot, opened the first Ars Electronica. There were a number of actions, activities, an interactive project where people were told to set up their radios in the window to turn Linz into a city of music. So all these elements taken together ultimately provided I read his publications, and this was my inspiration. I knew Herbert W. Franke would be the man for the first symposium and an exhibition. I added a number of names, but it was his basic thesis, arts and the computer. This is something we owe to Herbert W. Franke. All right, let's turn to Herbert W. Franke. Well, you, at that time, had the idea to combine arts and science. You were a scientist. You did a lot in the artistic field, computer graphics. You are an author. How important was the link between culture and science. How important was that for the founding of Ars Electronica? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Of course, I expected to be asked difficult, complicated questions. It's 40 years now that we meet again after 40 years. I'm very happy about that. Of course, I've grown 40 years older since 1979. My hearing is no longer good, so I didn't understand everything you said, but the things that I understood made me very happy. I don't think I should describe the things that I did Previously, I'm a physicist by training, and I found that 
the pictures, the images that physics uses can also be used to help us understand things. It's not just formulas, images, pictures became important. And this also meant that art plays a role. We can provide the public with images, pictures in scientific publications. And these pictures may be beautiful. Of course, you have to be careful when you talk about beautiful. But it's something which you may or may not understand. And I was very happy about that. And I got interested in the, theor the theoretical basis of art, cybernetics, at that time became a focus of scientific research. And cybernetics took up a number of important topics and issues, which are also interesting for artists. And this actually showed us that we, apart from enjoying the pictures, we gain additional knowledge. So I found that computers can play a very important role and that it was worthwhile to use the computer to generate images which fulfill exactly this function, that is, to disseminate knowledge and put it to practical use. I think that's enough uh, as a statement for now. I didn't earn my living by producing pictures. Rather, it was the books that I wrote. Maybe you have read one or the other of my books. And the changes that I write about all are about the future. And this, of course, means that there's a link to literature. So it all started with pictures which you can give to people as a gift. I hope to be able to continue uh, this kind of activity. Recently, my books on art and literature, adventures, were not only about space, missions, rather in those books I hope that I established a link between uh, the fine arts also and science. In some of the books that I wrote, I say that the pictures that are described by others are or should be conveyed to the reader so that the reader actually gets the feeling that he himself has gone through the experience that is described in the books. So art definitely plays a role in this regard. In this case, it's literature, of course. So I think I've told you enough about what I hopefully will be able uh, to do also in the next 10 years. Thank you very much. I 
I would just like to mention a number. Herbert W. Franke said, yeah, I wrote books. Do you know how many books he wrote? More than 100. True. More than 100. I didn't hear what you said. More than 100 books. Ah, oh, well, I think you've counted some of them twice. Well, I think the exciting thing is this diversity. The visions of 40 years, years ago have become a reality today. And it's fantastic to see how modest these uh, eyewitnesses answer our questions. Hannes Leopold Seder not only launched the festival with his team, he also uh, started the pre Ars Electronica, and then in the early 1990s there was another milestone, the Ars Electronica Center. So Ars Electronica now has a permanent home and has survived the last four decades or three decades. So we had a number of men with visions who got together. And at the same time, uh, there was someone who was powerful enough to communicate these ideas and visions. Hannes Leopold Eder was in charge of the ORF uh, center or headquarters in Upper Austria. So I think all of us can imagine what happens when a science and an artist, Hubert Bognermeyer, who unfortunately died, what would have happened if they had turned to the mayor and told them, we would like to organize a symposium on art technology and society and the electronic revolution, science fiction synthesizers. Probably they wouldn't have been allowed into the mayor's office in the first place. So I think this is a very good example showing what needs to be done in the future. It's not enough to be creative, to have wonderful ideas, to have a critical approach. Rather, we must uh, form uh, alliances that are strong enough to support these ideas. And I think this was the big achievement. Now, my task today is to sum up this early phase within a period a time of 30 minutes. Then we have another 30 minutes. Uh, so this is not a documentary event uh, describing the development of Ars Electronica. Rather, it's a birthday party. Late. <coughs> a birthday party where we invite all those people that we uh, enjoyed meeting or that we've, whom we've fought with during the last um, four decades. So we will move on to our next round. We need a few more chairs. We will continue with another three people, Peter Weibel, a very important personality contributing to the development of Ars Electronica. Gottfried Hattinger, could you perhaps move over there, Gottfried? He was responsible for the program of Aus Electronica for many years. In 1979, he was responsible for the graphic design of the first catalog. And then a woman, a lady, who was not just an observer, Regina Patsch. Why don't you sit next to Peter? She had uh, a large, she played a large number of roles in Ars Electronica, a journalist, an observer, responsible for many ORF documentaries on Ars Electronica. And in 1986, she was responsible for the program. So in the 1980s, Ars Electronica actually started to get an identity, 
I know this from the stories that I've heard. And uh, one of the people who was responsible for this was Peter Weibel. So I'd like to hand over to him. Ich komme nur auf die beiden Gründerväter und auf seine Frage, warum gerade Linz. Das ist sehr interessant. Weil äh, zu den, also in Wien, man hätte erwartet, dass das macht Wien. Ja? Weil in Wien hat es gegeben in den 20er, 30er Jahren den berühmten Wiener Kreis. Ja? Und die Leute des Wiener Kreises gehören zu den Gründungsvätern der Programmiersprache und der gesamten Computerphilosophie. Das berühmte Paper von Turing und Computable Numbers 1936 war eine Antwort auf die Arbeit von Gödel über unentscheidbare Sätze der Prinzipien Mathematiker. Ne? Und dieses berühmte Paper von, von Turing hat ja den zweiten Satz, das Entscheidungsproblem, das ist die Antwort auf Gödel. Ne? Also nur Sie, wie Sie wissen, sind aber der Wiener Kreis vertrieben worden, weil Sie waren in der Hauptsache Juden. Ne? Und dann nach dem Krieg hat er keiner mehr gewollt, dass die zurückkommen. Ne? Das heißt, aber Herbert de Frank war einer derjenigen, der als Wissenschaftsautor dieser Spiele, dieser Geist weitergemacht hat. Er hat zum Beispiel im Jahre 56, 1956 ein Buch gemacht, Die Welt der Moleküle. In 1956, he wrote a book, The World of Molecules. He was the first to um, describe the world of molecules. I was 14 years old. I read the book. I didn't understand it, but I read it. So you can see there is a long tradition. We are sitting at the same table today. He is uh, from the generation of the Vienna Circle, and I am as well. Vienna was reactionary after the end of the Second World War, so he went to Graz and Salzburg. Uh, um, but uh, mm, these cities didn't really catch up with the times, so what was left was Linz. Uh, uh, the logical way of thinking of the Vienna Circle was taken to Linz, uh, and uh, if it hadn't been for Hannes Leopold Seder, uh, we have nine uh, provinces in Austria. Each province has its own uh, studio, and you, of course you always need uh, um, the um, radio broadcasting stations, and it wouldn't have been possible with the, without the Upper Austrian um, radio broadcasting studio. So the great Austrian heritage of the Vienna Circle and other groups, similar groups, we had great economists, we had great uh, scientists, and many of them went to Linz because uh, uh, Vienna wouldn't let them do what they wanted to do. And this is what brought uh, Peter Weibel to Vienna, to Linz. Well, there were few uh, who still taught uh, logistics or later mathematic, mathematical logic. There were 12 people. Uh, working on computers. I wrote a book in 1974 on the theory of abstract automatons, and uh, I, it was a book about machines, but unfortunately only 10 copies of that book were sold. But I was well prepared. I was prepared for, for the age that was about to dawn. So I, was, I inherited a lot from the Vienna Circle, and I'm still a member of an institute called the Vienna, Vienna Circle Institute. And after 100, 100 years after the foundation, the first exhibition took place in Vienna. But let's talk about Ars Electronica. I was invited in 1964 by Gottfried Hattinger to produce a media opera. And then we said, we have to think about the future of Ars Electronica. At that time, Ars Electronica was taking place every other year. And I said, why not do it every year if we have good ideas? And let's have a symposium as well, a symposium dedicated to a certain topic. And we're going to invite artists who have a lot to say on this topic. And we had world-class uh, people here, including uh, Marvin Minsky and others. So world-class scientists uh, uh, with uh, great ideas. Uh, they were represented uh, through exhibitions, and they spoke at the symposium. 
Well, at that time we were talking about Ars Electronica, now we talk about digital technologies. And there are certain things I don't agree with today about the midlife crisis. There is no midlife crisis. We're at the beginning. Uh, of course, there are periods of exhaustion and fatigue, but that's only natural. Well, we've only existed for about 50 years. A transistor radio had five transistors. Without the transistor radio, there wouldn't have been any rock and roll revolution. Uh, in a few decades, uh, we made enormous leaps forward in terms of technology. Uh, I have no midlife crisis because I can imagine what's going to happen in the coming years. Well, we're not going to have a midlife crisis here today. We're going to dedicate uh, uh, this afternoon to the first uh, years. Now, the question is, is it a teething troubles? Is it a midlife crisis we're going through? But what really interests me is that both the activities that were launched in order to have an impact on the city, um, the great theoretical reflections, the philosophical contributions, so this turned Ars Electronica into an intellectual event. Uh, it uh, gave it its profile. But from the first sound cloud, uh, over the years, it's been possible to involve the city. It was a kind of duality between what was happening at the Bruckner House, at the symposium, and what was happening in the city. An alliance which is atypical because the city of Linz and ORF accounted for a major part of the program in Linz. And uh, as we heard earlier, Van Gogh TV was its pirate radio stations and the Linz Stadtwerkstatt. And I think Gottfried Hartinger has a lot to say on that because in 1991 he organized the Out of Control Festival, which really marked the onset of this subculture or this subversive culture even. Whatever you want to tell us. Thank you for calling me one of the uh, founding fathers. Well, this is something you have to accept. I was a graphic designer at the beginning and um, Mr. Leopold Seder needed an organizer and of course I was quite enthusiastic about doing something uh, modern and contemporary at the Bruckner House. And over the years uh, I sort of grew into it. I didn't have a portfolio of my own, but uh, I had the authority to initiate projects. Uh, I went to Vienna, I met uh, Peter Weibel there, and uh, this is how uh, we were able to make sure that Peter Weibel stayed with us as an artistic advisor and a co-organizer over the years. We did a lot in the public space. We involved the Linz scene throughout the decade. There were campaigns made by Stadtwerkstatt. The idea was to involve local artists in the festival. We didn't just want to bring in people from outside. And that was good for us, and it was good for the artists. 
dann gibt es in meiner Erinnerung nach die And if I remember correctly, my memory may fail me at times, but there were also events in the public space. The Danube Park concert, a kind of alternative uh, uh, sound cloud. For the first time, public space was used. Well, people in Linz still talk about that. When they talk about the history of Ars Electronica, uh, they remember the uh, sound of the marine horns uh, um, blown uh, on the ships on the Danube. But the alternative sound cloud, well, it didn't survive. Only 20,000 people were there. Uh, while the sound cloud attracted more than uh, 100,000 people. I also remember Friedrich Wonder and Heiner Goebel, uh, an event that started along the Danube and ended up uh, on the first premises. There's quite a lot that was going on. The festival in 1991, Out of Control, was particularly fascinating because many of the artists who were there said, well, I met so-and-so for the first time there, and then we started uh, cooperating. Leo Schatzel meeting Just Married, and they kept cooperating. A colony of artists evolved on the premises of First Alpine. They were allowed to work on the scrapyard of First Alpine, and we were able to use the premises, these industrial premises. The company was not just a potential sponsor, but also a venue of Ars Electronica. This is one of the founding myths. We have a wonderful history of great topics. When you think about what happened in the 19. Uh, 80s and 90s, virtual reality, nanotechnology, the World Wide Web story. But there is a second component to Ars Electronica, the impact on the city. And I'd like to refer to Gina Patch, Regina Patch. In 1996, she was responsible for the program. And when we searched uh, in our archives, we came across articles about the year of scandal, 1996. Now, what happened? What was the scandal? Peter Weibel was installed as an artistic advisor. That was one thing. And uh, in addition to the standard features of Ars Electronica, we focused on performance art um, related to the general topic of Ars Electronica. ORF launched the computer days, and we focused on performance art. Uh, Georg Hoffmann, Volki, as we called him, said he has a huge project because they had uh, transported a stone from Wales to India, minus Delta T, and we'd like to present that. So that was a kind of wild radio uh, performance. That was a predecessor of Van Gogh TV. And we said, yes, well, not, why not? Let's include uh, the wild guys. And we said that there would be a great performance, uh, opera death, the death opera in a uh, book now. And everybody said, OK, let's do that. And one day before the performance, uh, the uh, someone, uh, one of the stage workers said, they're going to kill a chicken in the Bruckner house. Now, what should we do? I said, 
there are two ways, two possibilities as an organizer, as the person responsible. You can either say, now you forbid the performance of the opera, then you're making headlines as someone who prevents art performances, or you let them kill the chicken and then it's a scandal. Uh, of course, we would never have uh, canceled an art project. It would have been inconceivable. We knew that we would raise, um, we, we would create a scandal. Uh, perhaps this is why uh, many remember that project. A year or two later, the group was invited to Documenta. Uh, as the art police at Documenta, but in Linz they raised a scandal. So 1986 must have been a year of crisis. There was a budgetary crisis, a problematic year altogether. But it had an enormous impact on the city, much more so than the great projects uh, within the framework of the festival. And it's quite significant that after 1986, the next big change came with the introduction of pre Ars Electronica. And this was important not just for Ars Electronica. It also shows that digital art, computer art at that time had already established itself so that you create, could create a pre Ars Electronica. It was Hannes Leopold's initiative, Christina uh, talked to many people about categories, but what was the idea behind it, Hannes? Well, the fundamental idea was if I said I said to myself, if I were a company having produced Ars Electronica for six or seven years, I would feel that I need to launch a new product, something that is more than a continuation of what has been there for years. I needed. Uh, I felt we needed a new idea, and that was pre Ars Electronica. We wanted to, to launch a worldwide competition for computer artists, for computer graphics, uh, computer animation, and music. Those were the three categories. Music, of course, had the longest tradition, and. Pre Ars Electronica uh, came with a high prize, one million Austrian shillings, something like 70 or 80,000 euro in today's money. I wanted to uh, offer a high prize for the winner because I wanted to attract attention. It was the biggest prize ever awarded in Austria because all the prizes awarded by the federal government were much lower. But it wasn't just money. It was the fundamental idea. With the first pre Ars Electronica, we got many entries from all over the world, from many countries of the world. I think. 60 countries, entries from 60 countries, or 57 or something like that, 720 entries altogether from 25, four countries, I'm being corrected. 24 is also a sizable figure. After all, it was 1987. Now we get submissions from far more countries. Um, three to four thousand uh, submissions from over 100 countries, a gigantic development. What I remember, because for me personally, as a would-be artist, I always uh, observed uh, 
uh, Ars Electronica very carefully. And around pre-Ars Electronica, there was a conflict which has flared up again and again over the past 40 years because the money was donated by Siemens, a technology group. And the question put to Ars Electronica always was, how do you manage the balance between uh, proximity to industry, which was necessary in order to work with technology, and the claim uh, to be critical in the society. Perhaps Peter Weiber can say something about that. It's been a tradition that the federal chancellor opened the award ceremony. I think this started with the award ceremony because uh, the high prize money made uh, the prize socially acceptable. One million Austrian shillings, that was even told even the government that this must be an important event. And the fact that money uh, comes from industry um, didn't really matter for me. Uh, what was more important for me were the debates in the jury, because what is electronic art? The jury discussions were always difficult. Uh, it was difficult to agree to agree on what uh, was to be awarded the prize. We started with uh, John Lasseter from Pixar, who got the first prize. And many said, well, this is someone from Hollywood. This is commercial art. That was an interesting debate in the jury. And in the case of Pixar, this was a collective uh, work. It wasn't uh, the work of an individual. We wanted to reward individuals. The sponsoring didn't really matter to me. But another thing that shouldn't be forgetten, forgotten, Ars Electronica had good contacts with Medianet uh, from the US and the Bnet. We needed uh, to be recognized by uh, the US, and even the MIT recognized what we were doing, and that was important for us. Um, Otopine was very important for us, as well as Namjoon Pike. I think Otto Pine was here for the first time in 1980, and he was here a second time in 1982 for the Sky Art Conference, a big international conference. We had artists and scientists from the US and experts in the field. This was extremely important for us because it opened up the road uh, to America and it allowed us to establish contacts with individual American artists. That was an important milestone in the history of Ars Electronica. Well, it's time for us to start the next part. Uh, we go back to 1980. Uh, 1978, 1980, and I'd like to quote from the program brochure of uh, the first uh, Ars Electronica inspired by Herbert W. Franke. Uh, the catalogs are all online. You can uh, read them in the archives. Read the article from 1979 by Herbert W. Franke, and you will be flabbergasted uh, to learn how far-sighted he was in terms of uh, technology. He had a real vision that uh, this would get a cultural and social dimension. In 1979, you wrote that electronics has introduced a progressive element, element to the world of technology, the influence of which is not limited to research and science, but 
um, acts on all walks of life. It opens up fantastic aspects, but it also gives rise to criticism and skepticism. And if I had replaced the term electronics by the term uh, artificial intelligence, this could have been taken for a, an up-to-date statement by Ars Electronica or by a journal talking about uh, what's happening these days. So you had visions and were able to implement them. And you had a single focal point, which was the role of humans. Of course, we are perhaps suffering from some thieving trouble or going through a midlife crisis. Uh, well, we didn't want to call it the midlife crisis of Ars Electronica, but therefore we chose the midlife crisis of the digital revolution. But the eternal question is, what is the role of art, creativity, and education in our um, biographies? We have always claimed to contribute uh, towards changing the world. And during the coming three hours, we want to explore that further. Of course, we could have talked about so many things, but we didn't have time for that because we want to talk not only about the founding years, but uh, we want to hear from uh, 30 different protagonists of this development from the United States, from Japan and other countries, and we want to hear about what happened to those 40 years. New forms of art um, were developed, uh, net art, uh, as a new category, and of course, biotechnology-based art, genetic-engineering-based art, or what are the opportunities of machine learning and artificial intelligence for artistic creation and reception. So please stay with us. We're going to rearrange the scene a bit. We've invited so many people to our birthday party that we are going to leave the stage and the first rows will be the seatings for uh, our speakers, so we'll have to rearrange the scene a bit. So thank you very much for having joined us for a short statements reflecting on the early years of Ars Electronica.
You're welcome. Thanks for having me. We are just okay. Microphone. So, während wir While we are changing the seats and the order again, the idea is that now for the next sessions, the experts, the long-term contributors to Ars Electronica and the world of digital media, they should be seated around here in the first rows and maybe the audience want to be rather here on this side so you can really enjoy uh, the view over there. And while we are changing the setting, I have a very interesting uh, topic also to announce and to present, because of course the history of Ars Electronica is a very long and intense one, and we try to document it with many exhibitions, archival uh, presentations and things like this, but we also found somebody who became the biographer of Ars Electronica. Andreas Hirsch uh, started a year ago to conduct many, many interviews uh, with the forefathers, the founders, up to the people who are running Ars Electronica right now with many contributing artists. And he wrote this wonderful book that you can actually purchase for the super cheap price of 28 euros in our Post City shop over there. And it's the most comprehensive short, brief history of the whole development of Ars Electronica and maybe Andreas can tell us a little bit about his findings in this book. Thank you. I mean, not, not every day like today we have the privilege to listen to those people who were the agents of this history. So for all the other days we have to rely on the digital archive and on endeavors like this one. Uh, a book like this one strives or hopes to be a filter to the mass of uh, contributions that are summed up during those 40 years. So many artists, so many experts, so many projects uh, that have been piling up. And of course, we all have the need and I think also the desire uh, to make sense of all this to put all this in a meaningful context. This is something that this book strives to do, yeah? to let us understand the context of what happened here in Linz, why maybe it happened here, and also to understand uh, how the impersonal forces of technology, of economy, of politics that have been shaping the events uh, are balanced by the personal forces of certain individuals. Individuals that, after all, make a difference at certain points in a development. So this book, uh, yeah, tries to take you in a hopefully digestible form uh, through those uh, entire 40 years that somehow already make history. While we are continuing the discussions and the presentations here, you are going to give a history guided tour through the exhibitions. When does it start? At 3, in 20 minutes. So you can decide, do you want to listen to the experts or do you want to join uh, Andreas on a guided tour through the history exhibitions? That's the terrible thing with these festivals, you always have to make choices. And again, thank you very much, Andreas, for this really wonderful uh, work. Uh, it's a book that is really very interesting to read because of the many details. Even I learned uh, quite a lot of new details from the early years, or even from the years that I'm responsible, uh, through all the interviews that you conducted. And uh, anyway, thank you again and good luck with your history tour. And I'm now asking... Carla, are we ready to start the next session? It will be started by somebody who is also, as I said today, a Urgestein of Ars Electronica, which means something very nice, like dinosaur or fossil or something. 
of Ars Electronica, uh, Hiroshi Ishii from MRD Media Lab. Uh, in particular, uh, the period starting with 96 that uh, I had a wonderful pleasure and opportunity to direct this organization, Hiroshi became really a very important also mentor and guiding star for my activities. Uh, we could invite him already in the very early years to show the research of his tangible media research group at the festival and later in uh, the Ars Electronica Center and uh, three years ago now, 2016, we made even a whole festival together, the Radical Atoms Festival. So thank you again for being such a continuous and strong supporter and contributor to Ars Electronica and now the floor is yours. Vielen Dank. Danke schön. It's a very great pleasure to come back to our Technica every year. Especially, it's such an important moment to reflect back history and envision the future. So, first of all, most important thing is happy birthday, our Technica, for this anniversary. That's something amazing. So. Also hearing from real founders, pioneers who built this grant in the previous session, something really great honors and also amazing for us. So because, because opportunity of this 40th anniversary, I think it makes sense to think about history or heritage towards the future. So how we should really learn from the past histories, then how to really archive our work towards the futures, also future artists or future archeologists, and uh, in this context, I think uh, museums play a very critical role, as well as libraries. How to capture knowledge for the, our descendants is something very important missions. In that context, heritage is something important keyword. There's a lot of discussion in the uh, media community about digital heritage. And I've been in a community called ACM Sikai, Computer Human Interaction, for 30 years. And uh, then uh, I have to really reflect what I've done in the past 30 years because I had opportunity to give a lecture uh, on Lifetime Sikai Lifetime Research Award. But the compressing 30 years, telling a coherent story is not an easy uh, job. But uh, I really enjoyed this uh, uh, exercise. So first, 1990, uh, clear about seamless media, which I did in the tele telecommunication industries. Then, after moving to MIT, I started Tandrebits to defy the gravity of pixel empire. And uh, also, in the past 10 years, we started the radical atoms to make atoms dance. But uh, everything is uh, in the theme of the, you can see the bottom, the battle against the pixel empire. How to really fight against this pixel empire is one of the key uh, ideas I've been working for years. But also, the for me, best thing is radical atoms that started from HCI research, scientific HCM research, really nicely cross over with R Electronica, which I love for in the past 20 years. Then, Gelfti Stocker came a really great uh, uh, subtitle, Alchemist of our time. Why don't we create new materials for our artistic expression, communication design? That's really powerful message, also great moment that the HCI, human computer interaction research, cross with media arts communities. So let me go quickly to reflect back. 1995, I joined MIT Media, then decided to make digital tangible. Digital is fundamentally abstract, also pixel, so intangible. So I want to make invent new interactions that inspire and engage people. That's really cross over the mission of the media arts. So three things I care, tangible, aesthetics, interactive, and that two, most important is how to inspire people, how to really make people think, and also how to engage through the interaction. Then history comes in. We, have, we learn so many things from historic scientific instruments. It's already there, it's amazing, beautiful tools to represent knowledge of human beings. People observed sky, night, night sky, then create knowledge about the solar system or astronomy. Then they made a beautiful uh, tools called Orari which also has a very good interface. It's a handle, which was supposed to be grabbed by you or by us. Then once you grab, once you rotate, this machine, all the solar systems, is a, 
extension, your body, your muscle, and kinesthesia, or neurons, neuro, a neural network, or whatever, is screaming in, in sync with the movement of the planet around the sun. That kind of engagement is completely missing in current point and click or touching screen. Also important thing is collaboration. If you are in a classroom, you can clearly see which portion your friends are uh, watching or which, which planet your teacher is pointing out. All these social spatial cue is also missing in the current environment. Of course, you may say VR, but fundamentally VR is the most important communication channel, gaze. Another instrument which also inspired me is Abacus. How many people can compute with Abacus? Okay, you, you guys should be able to do this. But of course, Abacus is a very interesting instrument. Abacus makes digit physically embodied. You can touch it. So it's a tangible. But more than that, transparency. Nothing is hidden as a black box, so you can easily understand using quality reasoning. If you shake, it becomes a musical instrument, become a toy train, also you can scratch a back without reading any manual written by Google engineer, because no black box. This is called affordance. That's also completely missing in the current uh, HCI. So then we did a lot of the crazy stuff, and uh, this is an example of radical atoms, uh, which we exhibited in Arosetica for three years. How many people really saw this piece? Just ended this summer, but uh, since 2016, uh, we had uh, this exhibit. So can I get a sound? Okay, anyway, so this is a telepresence. Uh, Daniel Reitzinger, Professor Daniel Reitzinger, who used to be the uh, staff in the Future Lab, uh, came to my group. Then he did this PhD uh, based on the new materials, which dance, computationalists. Also, we are always interested about exploring uh, artistic expressions. We love MC Escher. This is inspired by MC Escher. How we can really instantiate uh, his infinite like, a maze or impossible structure using uh, those uh, materials. So this is a new clay materials to use for the expression. So combining three machines called INFORM, then following the uh, method of triptych, we made a kinetic triptych, which is called uh, TRANSFORM, which we exhibit in Milan Design Week. So let me show the, so do I get the sound? Anyway, uh, you may see that, uh, okay. Red ball is old materials, frozen atoms, like this wood or metals. There's no digital consciousness, but now this material has digital guts. It can dance dynamically based on data or algorithm. But also red ball, frozen atoms can dance with the new materials, radical atoms. So this is one of the example of dance and interaction or data. But uh, our intention is how to really turn those stuff as a new stimuli, new materials, new energy. So I also think uh, I've been here for 22 years. I'm still young uh, in comparison to 40 years history. But the first uh, participation to Arosetonica is 1997, Fresh Factor. That's a really great catch copy. How to bring a factor of the fresh, our body, into the equation. So that's exactly coincided with tangible bits. So we exhibited the in touch and triangles. And the 2000, year 2000, I did an exhibition in NTT ICC, that's a tangible exhibition, which also became one of the uh, springboard to go to the, come back to the uh, Arosetica centers. So we had a get in touch uh, exhibition in the old centers uh, for three years, running a variety of the projects, which you might still remember, like in touch or music bottles, ping pong plus, to show the new way to interact with the digital world or computation. Then something really, really uh, amazing things happened. Thanks to uh, Gerfried and the host, other people, they picked up our, my fuzzy, abstract uh, notion of the radical atoms as a real banner to encouraging artists to become an alchemist to create new materials using technology, bio, or material science. That's a very profound message. Then we had a really great uh, time with a bunch of students, a bunch of the exhibit stuff, and I hope you have a chance to see the also, uh, Katrina helped a lot. Also, this is a biologic. So, through this exhibition, I had uh, so many uh, interactions with friends, artists, philosophers, or students. That also helps a lot. Also, it's a very surrealistic. Entire city become radical atoms. That's kind of the, uh, a bit of sci-fi stuff. But also another example of the exhibition is how to really communicate abstract concept like a biologic. This is one of the examples we did. Can I get a sound? So this bacteria, natural bacteria, become a 
relative humidity sensor and the actuators. Now you can see film dancing based on the steamboat. So this is showing the basic function enabler. Uh, this is what nature gave us. It's a biological all the materials. But we wanted to make a second skin, wrapping the human body, then breathe based on the sweat or heat. So this is a abstract models of the human body, but not so exciting. Very exciting beauty is a professional performer, dancer from Boston Ballet companies. They collaborated wearing a biologic suits, but they can feel the change of the air. Then they change the way they dance. So they told me, it looks like their dancing is not to bacteria. Because you never write scientific papers. But it's very interesting from artist con context. Also, I like an out-of-box message. How do they go out of the box, but the cross fertilizations keep looping among those like four dimensions, art, science, technology, design, also maybe business, is something important. Having some idea, then translate across all these dimensions. Then making a spiral to the 3D. This is my favorite uh, uh, Bruegel painting of the Tower of the Bubbles. But that's something uh, important. So to communicate uh, this uh, essence, transdisciplinary, I always use invent and inspire. Invention, we do it. But how to communicate, how to really stimulate other people through the museum exhibition, or writing paper, or uh, lecturing is something important. So to summarize, I think be artistic and analytic and also be poetic and pragmatic. Those are the key two messages I've been always thinking. So Heritage Museum, ours has amazing historic art track record to collect all the great work. So there's a Japanese word called onko chishin, means dream the future from the past, learning from the past. That's a very profound message. History is the base of the future, like a jump. So you can go to library and the book, all the knowledge there. Also, this museum has all the great stuff archived. Then, for sale, also uh, heritage. So I think there are so many things we have to really archive and learn to, to the next future. So I think a core message I want to really discuss in the session is what legacy do we, should we really archive? Also, why, for whom, and how? Also, how far distant futures? Because technological platforms change every two, 10 years. Then nothing can be played in near future. Also, how to tell the story? How can they recall? So I think envisioning the future seems something very exciting topics. So that ends my very short introduction. Thanks to all you guys. Thank you. Sorry for being so bushy, but uh, it's the afternoon also of conversations, and uh, there is still uh, two more experts that we have for this first session. John Cage, uh, Cates, it's just too much, you know, as a musician, when the brain sings, <laughs> the tongue works differently. So it's unfortunately not John Cage, but <laughs> nevertheless, John Cates uh, here as an expert and also Derek de Kerkhofer. And the idea is to reflect a little bit now uh, with uh, the other two experts also about how has this world of art and technology developed in the United States, which is actually the place where most of this technology that artists are using right now is coming. And we have again three chairs here. And Carla, who is moderating now? Hiroshi is moderating. So this is amazing student sessions <laughs> because U.S., Canada, also half Japan and half U.S. But uh, let's jump in to the uh, topics. So I'd like to hear from uh, your thoughts about uh, all the topics we are discussing today. Hello, my name is John Cates and I'm the curator of an exhibition which is above us right now. It is on a floor above this floor. Uh, it is called Chicago New Media and I'm here from Chicago, that's correct. And if you find the exhibition above us, you get a very special prize because it is in a maze and so you must go up through the maze and then if you are very lucky and dedicated, as I know you shall be, 
you will get uh, rewarded by experiencing Chicago New Media. It's an uh, exhibition which I curated and which we opened last year in Chicago, and it's now on its uh, world tour, and it's its first stop is here at Ars Electronica, so that's a very, it's a very nice first stop for uh, an exhibition. Yes, yes. <laughs> And uh, it is presented with the VGA Gallery, which is also from Chicago, and that is the VGA, not the um, connection port, but the Video Game Art Gallery. So uh, they are also joining us here today. That's Jonathan Kinkley and Chaz Evans. They are the founders of the Video Game Art Gallery, and they're here with me today. Um, it's a really special um, gallery. It's also a very special exhibition because it tells the story uh, when we started to uh, have this conversation with Gerfried and with Ars Electronica, it was because we were going to tell the story of the 40 years of Ars Electronica from a Chicago perspective, so from a different perspective. But it's a perspective that has been connected to uh, Linz for quite some time. So we're connected in a few different ways, um, but one of the ways that we're connected is that we are a, a media art histories approach to the intersection between art and games in this exhibition in particular. So media art histories are histories which are told by media art and media artists and media art historians. And histories are often referred to as stories that are told by historians. So I would be very happy to tell you a number of stories about art and games in Chicago and how they have also been always connected to glitches, to software, to digital art, to lens. Um, stories about a man with a beard much bigger and wider than my own, wearing a Viking cap and standing in a virtual reality system that he had created in 1991. The same person who is standing also next to an analog computer that he created in 1971. So we could talk all about those stories and how they're related to contemporary games and the material of history. That would be very exciting. But that's just a hello from myself, from Chicago. Hello. <clears throat> well, I'm Derek de Kerkhove. I'm terribly grateful. Every time that I come to Ars Electronica, I don't consider it at all as an entitlement. I consider it every time as a special and new favor. And it's because every time that I've come here, and my first time was in 1990, uh, I have learned enormous amount of things. And even though I've only spent a morning running around waiting for, for the lineup to be a little less long, I already have learned so many fabulous things today that I'm going to carry home. And that's one of the fabulous thing about Ars Electronica. When I arrived here in 1990, I was, it was the same year that I had been privileged to be invited to three uh, really interesting world conferences. The first one was uh, Art Futura in Barcelona, and it was an absolutely wonderful conference as well, much more focused on the art and technology than what happened here, but nevertheless, really a marvelous conference. Then Mondi Virtuali, run by Maria Grazia Mattei. She's not here now, but she is here today. And that was a very nice one as well. And then it was Art Futura. And it was an amazing experience all, every time. I was, at the time, running the, the McLuhan program at the University of Toronto. And one of the reasons I was interested in art and technology was because of one con counsel that McLuhan had given me. He said, uh, if you want to know what's going on in your time, uh, don't ask your colleagues, professors. They are living in the past. Uh, those who are living in the present uh, are living in the future. But the one who knows about the present is the artist. And the person who can, inter can interpret the impact of technology on, on people is the artist. That is, the artist studies the effect, not the cause. And so that was a very powerful uh, vision of art that was, I think, very strongly expressed by uh, Ars Electronica. Among the myths, you were ta talking, uh, Gerf Gerfried, you were talking about the founding myth. Uh, I thought you were going to talk about things, mistakes that people made about what Ars Electronica. Well, I have a founding myth, which was my mistake, but it's a good mistake, so I might as well report it. Uh, 
what, what inspired me, among many other things at Ars Electronica over the years, uh, has been a, a myth that I thought that Ars Electronica was Hannes and Christine's idea going to meet <laughs> the mayor and telling him, you want to secure the future of your children in a, in, a, in a dying economy, that of heavy manufacturing and so on, we're going to tell you all about electronics. And I thought, well, that's exactly what happened. Well, it, apparently it happened a bit that way, but not exactly the way I thought. But that's a myth that I carried with me because I am extremely interested in this issue. How do you actually stimulate a city? You can call that the Bilbao effect if you want, when you know, once you build an extraordinary architecture, then the whole world starts talking about you and just follows things. But this has been a particularly very powerful aspect of Ars Electronica for me. Another one has been the professional quality. I was attending several conferences and there were lots of them that were very good and very well run, but the more exacting one is Ars Electronica. This is where everything is done extremely well, with extraordinary attention to detail and with a very strong sense of the quality of the selection. Of course, I've been selected, so I should say that, but I'm very happy to say that I have met so many extraordinary people here that have allowed me to go much further in my own, my own thinking. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> well, you know, I could give you so many names, but I, just the ones that came out to my mind. I, I was amazed at the beauty of the work of Toshio Iwai, for example, who I saw for the first time here. Um, I, was, I was impressed also very much by Carl Sims and uh, Patty Mas and their work with the... There was all kinds of different thematics that came through and that actually kept you, you know, going, uh, going forward. I was honored also to be member of the jury a couple of times and uh, met, met again, uh, I met Joito as member of the jury when we discovered webness. So th this, this, has been a, this has been one of the, the most enduring and uh, uh, endearing experience of continuous education for me. And I'm sure that many of the people who are here, some of, so many of which I do recognize, probably feel the same way, that coming here is, is a kind of an accelerator moment, uh, sort of a, a cultural accelerator that has been extremely, extremely powerful for me. One of the things that I've always come up, <laughs> one of the things that I've always done when I've come here, uh, leaving Ars Electronica, and I conclude on this word, but it's really important to think about it, I always have been trying to imagine what would be the theme for the following year. Well, I've got one for you. I, no, I think I've got one really very useful one. It's the digital twin. The digital twin is, is a concept of engineering that was actually quite a banal concept of engineering. From the moment you have machines, you need to have maintenance, maintenance system for those machines and so on. The digital twin is the digital twin of a turbine and it knows everything about the turbine and if you have to repair it, you know, you can find the right numbers just by studying the software and so on. But the digital twin's real destiny is the person. We have developed within, in the history of literacy, in the history of writing and the use of language, we've, been, we've learned to develop from within. Now that we are exporting our insides, our memory goes into, soft, into, into data banks, we need to develop from without. And we will be developing from without more and more. So the idea of knowing what the digital twin concept as it is applied to humans as opposed to machines can become is for me one of the most, most pressing themes. Another pressing theme is complementary. It is the invention of social credits in China. That's a social aspect of the future. When everything is known about you, then one way of defense is develop your digital twin but the other way is to figure out how to relate to that extraordinary new power that the politics are putting in. So these are themes, complementary themes, that I think, I'm not saying you should do it, but I'm just saying, when I leave Ars Electronica, that's one of the things I think about. Sure. Um, part of what else is exciting for me personally to be here uh, is that media arts, new media art, is intergenerational and has always been intergenerational and is especially explicitly so now. We cannot ignore the presence of histories and so that is part of what 
Ars Electronica is doing this year. That is the theme, that is the basis, that is the focus, is to acknowledge a personal history, but also a history that is greater and part of the larger project of new media art, media art, etc. So this is an intergenerational discourse. It's a conversation that crosses generational lines. And as such, it also always involves and impacts genealogies. So these are genealogies that are familial relationships. We are families. And we are really here together as a sort of family. And not necessarily in the biological sense, but families are also chosen. People choose the families that they identify with and that they're going to be intimately, deeply involved in. And so that is part of what people are doing here, is that they are choosing to be a part of this familial relationship between one another, which constitutes the conversation and constitutes the discourse of media art. It is that ongoing familial generational conversation and it has inheritances. So there are, we have to respect and protect those types of inheritances that come from generations before us so that we can work with those as materials. Histories are material. We, are, we live in a material world. We are material people affected by the material conditions of the material worlds that we live in. It's hot in here. It's hotter upstairs, I guarantee you. But these are the material realities. Computers also produce a lot of heat. Electronics produce a lot of heat. So the material realities of the world that we live in have a direct impact. And also the media arts that are made are, in some ways, we can discuss how they are ephemeral and fleeting and made of digits and, and numbers, etc. But they are also literal material existence. And you can work with those histories as materials. So that's part of my approach. And what I've done in the exhibition that is upstairs is that there are artists who are remixing and reworking the material histories of media art to make new media art from existing media art as part of an ongoing intergenerational conversation. And I think that that's a really important point because it's about both respecting and protecting, but also getting deeply involved and working with that material. Thanks, John. Very beautifully concluding what the mission's purpose of the exhibition, preserving all the culture, but to the next generations. So, uh, Derek, I think I met you first in the Marshall McLuhan Center in the University of Toronto in 1992, and you were the world expert of the McLuhan. From McLuhan's point of view, do you have any advice or suggestion for others to continue to evolve towards the future? <clears throat> no, never, never take a McLuhan's uh, name in vain here. Um, I think what I, what I said was what he was very keen about. He, he was very interested in art, uh, and he was interested in the, in the effect, the whole effect theory, so that uh, he was interested in the method of Edgar Poe, for example. Uh, you start with what you expect your audience to experience. Kind of impressionistic technique as well, you know. The impressionism doesn't paint, doesn't uh, represent the object or the person. It represents the effect that the object or that person will have on the looker. And that is a very strong thing. Uh, and it's, not, it's still not very much applied. It's only artists to do these things. Artists look for effect, but um, scientists look for, they, they look for, you know, the, mechan the kind of articulation of the cause into something that's going to be produced. But it's, it's that very much uh, dimension of, uh, of the method that McLuhan would, uh, would, have, would have liked about this. He would have loved being invited here. He would have absolutely found it an extremely interesting experience, and he was kind of critical. So yeah, I would, I would say it's a good question, and uh, there's the answer. Thank you. We have so many topics we want to discuss, but the life is short. Also, time for the session is short. My dear friend, Kara, is sending a very strong signal. So I'd like to thank to uh, all of you, also Derek, and also John, also Delfried, who gave us this opportunity for this opportunity. So thank you very much. So thank you for the audience. And uh, please don't miss the exhibition upstairs. Yeah. Thank you.
Hi, hi, bang, bang. Hi, uh, Gerfried is on the phone, so I will introduce myself and everybody else. Hey, Frank Zavar, we never met actually. You cool? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, one, two, three, four. Hey, come to me. Uh, hey, we'll talk later. Hi, my name is Vuk. I don't wear a tag, and neither do you. I like that, or neither do you. We are uh, four of us, also Josephine. We are supposed to be this next panel, and our, some, uh, it's called Net Art. And uh, let's see, you have plugged in your machine. You want to be first? No? Okay. Uh, we, have, uh, we were given a very vague task of uh, talking about net art, and, uh, which is a field that somehow is our common field, but we have decided to not contribute to the glorification of our beautiful selves so much, and instead uh, these three characters are going to give super brief outlines of how they think everybody should think. This is, I believe, correct. And uh, then I will try to wrap it up in a way nobody exits the room uh, uh, not insulted. So, Andreas Brockmann, my friend, who speaks perfect German. Vuk, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to the Ars Electronica for the invitation. Um, we agreed that we will not tell the story of net art that many of you already know and that we bring a few things that might be a little bit surprising, at least for us here on the panel. And I think I would like to put things into focus um, in relation to some events that happened in France in the 1980s and that were connected to the Ars Electronica at the time. And if somebody could get me a, a drink of water, that would be really excellent. Um, this Merve publication from the German, the Berlin Merve publisher, was probably the first time that I came across the Ars Electronica. It was published on the occasion of the 1988 uh, symposium, and The organizers, interestingly, Peter Gente and Heidi Paris, made an explicit reference to the Les Immateriaux exhibition, which they had seen and published a book on with Leotard in 1985. So I would like to take you back from Ars Electronica 1988 to Les Immateriaux and to the Computer Culture Symposium and show some network art related projects and in this case, I'll have to skip the references to the also really interesting Electra exhibition um, in Paris. The Immateriaux exhibition was a huge thing at the Centre Pompidou that had a great variety of exhibits dealing with critical questions around new technologies, art, science, and materiality. Um, one of the contexts that relate to where we are here in Linz was the publication that came out of the Centre Pompidou, um, the Centre de Création Industrielle. This was a, a journal called Traverse, and in the year 1985, the year of the Immateriaux, they actually published two editions which more or less created a discursive context for this exhibition, and Baudrillard, who was at the symposium in 1988, was one of the editors of the Traverse series. In the exhibition itself, there was this one site towards the end called the Labyrinth de Langage, the Labyrinth of Language, where a number of mainly screen-based projects around language, memory, also some hypertext projects and projects around electronic writing were being presented. And some of these projects were on Minitel terminals. The um, electronic network in France that preceded the World Wide Web by more than 10 years. Those terminals were available both in the exhibition and also for people to check the webs the, the, those projects 
online at home. One of these projects was by Jacques-Élie Chabert and Camille Philibert. It was called Objet Perdu, and it was a hypertext graphic novel that they developed and laboriously uh, worked on. Um, and at the moment, they are actually in progress uh, trying to revive this, reconstructing it at the Pamal Center in Avignon. And the other project that I would like to show was called Art Accès, so Access Art, an, a magazine that was also available on Minitels in the exhibition and anywhere in France on the Minitel network. It was a project of Frédéric de Velay, Frédéric Martin and Orlan, who you see here in the picture uh, showing the project off at the uh, Paris Art Fair, um, I think just after the Immaterial. The project had to be laboriously... Uh, no, they invited about 100 artists to submit ideas, submit drafts, submit um, sketches for a series of screen designs that would be realized for the Minitel in the name of these artists whose names you probably can't read on the screen now. And I'm showing you this picture of Frédéric de Velay because in the front, on the right-hand side, you see the Minitel terminal, and in the picture on the left, at the bottom, you see the console with which the screen pages were laboriously designed. These were then realized in close collaboration with the artists, and here you see the team working with John Cage on his contribution to the Accès online art magazine. The archive of this project exists, but it has not been studied thoroughly yet, and this is part of a long-term research project on the material that I'm involved in. Let me end with another delicate connection between Les Immateriaux and the Ars Electronica. One site in the exhibition dealt with artificial smells and showed a computer animation that the artists Michel Brett, Monique Naas and Evi Utrich had worked on in 1984. It was also shown at the SIGGRAPH uh, in 84, I think, before the Immateriaux. The following year, in 1986, Wittrich and Nabas were also here at the Ars. But two years before Les Immateriaux, they had already been in Avignon presenting computer animations and offering a workshop on computer imaging. That same year, also, that same event also comprised a conference where, amongst others, Willem Flusser spoke. This was the occasion for Thierry Chaput, one of the curators of the Immateriaux, to meet a whole crowd of people like he would here at the Ars Electronica. And from here, five years later, um, Flusser would come to the Ars Electronica and bring me full circle in this short narrative. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm going to need um, the assistance of one of my colleagues soon. My name is Josephine Bosma. I've been writing about and uh, doing interviews uh, with artists who work with the internet since 1993 and um, have been writing, publishing a lot of interviews and texts since 1996 on the topic. And um, what happens in such a case is that people start to um, look at you as an expert. And I just want to um, make sure that it's clear that in this context, it's very difficult to be an expert, or at least to be the expert. I think it's practically impossible. And I want to illustrate that by showing you a work by the Uruguayan artist Brian Meckern. Brian Meckern has been 
collecting works of South American net art from 1998 till 2003. Uh, he co collected these uh, in a, a website or database called the Net Art Latino Database. And by, well, after the millennium change, he already started having problems with this database because it was crumbling, of course. Many, many dead links. Um, then he, I don't know exactly, I, I forgot when exactly he had an exhibition about this topic uh, in Spain. Uh, that must have been maybe 10 years later, so around 2010, 2013, I'm not sure. And for this exhibition, they made a catalogue. And that's what, I'm, what I have with me here. Uh, maybe it's also important to say that my definition of net art with what we are talking about here is uh, the broadest possible definition, I think. Uh, it's art that's influenced uh, by the inf internet that, uh, is, is in which the internet plays a vital role and that means it doesn't have to be online. It can be something entirely different from what you experience through a web browser. Um, so this, this work by Brian um, is a work of art in itself. So it's, it's really, it's a, it's a database, it's an archive of works, which in itself is also a work. Um, I have two things here with me. <laughs> it's a bit com complicated to juggle. But so what he did, they pro produced this this uh, catalog, I was really happy yesterday to go to the ZKM, yeah, be careful because the thing is, so it's a catalog of uh, an exhibition about a database. A database, watch, watch it, that is so fragile, it's falling apart. I think that 80, 90% of it already is dead links now. And what do I discover? Well, when I first opened it, it was already the, the, the the pages are very thin, so it's, it's a little scary to turn them. And now, as I got this book from my hotel room to my dismay, I discovered the book itself is falling apart. So the back uh, of it is now has come loose in the, in the travel to Ars Electronica. But uh, what I want to show you is what I discovered when I opened it uh, at home. Namely, there, there is a printout of the entire database in it, and you have to realize that just about every line, almost every line in this printout, is a work of South American net art between 1998 and 2003. I had no awareness of whatsoever, and, and most of the people in this room the same. Yeah. So that's just why I say no experts. Uh, can you hold the mic for a moment? And we just take this out, yep. and we have to unroll it together. Okay. Oh, um, tell me Unfold it together. We see it's here, so it's falling apart. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Try to. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. the beginning. You, you take, this is the part. The first part there. Don't turn. <laughs> Somebody should. So we're going to try and unravel it. Oh. As I said, it's very fragile. Well, anyway, I think Brian is going to be grateful that I illustrate his point. And um, just give me this. I, th I think you get the point. Look at what I still have here. So this is many, many, many meters long. Huh? And just about every line is a URL. Um, uh, <laughs> this morning I was talking about uh, telecommunications art. Just fold it up again, because it's, it's useless, it's, it's hopeless. So uh, you can see history falling apart. Uh, you see archaeology, you see, uh, well, how do we call this? Um, uh, preservation of net art failing here. Um, this morning I was talking about telecommunications art in another panel. 
And um, what, the, what was the point I was trying to make about that? There was a point. Oh yeah, I remember. Um, uh, the, the, the connecting link between that talk and this talk is the net art anthology for Rhizome. So, uh, The World in 24 Hours by Robert Adrian is in the net art anthology because I told them it should be in there. Uh, Brian McKern is also an advisor for the net art anthology and um, he took one of the words, works that are in here, just one of them, and they just had it restored. So it's now in there and it's called Epithelia by Mariela Yeregu, if I uh, say that correctly. It's from 1999, and from what I've seen from it, it's a very, very complex and very much layered work. Reminds a little bit of Olya Lialina's um, uh, Agatha appears and my boyfriend came back from the war. So it plays with frames and lots of uh, uh, links inside, internal links. and you should check it out. I think it's worthwhile to check out that anthology anyway, if you want to know about NetArt. It's very, it has many different advices from different parts of the world and um, very different approaches also. So I guess that's it. And I'm going to try to fold this up and get it back into the book somehow. It's there. Hello, my name is Franz Xaver and I'm speaking for Stadtwerkstatt and also for myself. Uh, also Stadtwerkstatt is in this year 40 years, 40 years in Linz was found, uh, Stadtwerkstatt was founded 79. Um, I worked with Stadtwerkstatt middle of the 80s to middle of the 90s and after 2009 till now. Stadtwerkstatt did a lot of media, art, broadcasting, uh, uh, broadcasting, television, live shows. So we have a really big archive of pre-internet and post-internet uh, uh, things. Yeah. Uh, post-internet things, we are working since a few years uh, about Information Lab, it's called Information Lab, and it's, uh, it's about uh, what is information and what uh, in which direction brings us this uh, uh, information technology. Yeah. In the beginning, uh, in the 80s, Stadtwerkstatt was against this uh, push media of the 80s. Yeah. This was uh, controlled mostly by the government and it was one direction media and uh, in this sense we make uh, like Van Gogh TV or Radio Subcom uh, broadcasts and so on to have a two-way uh, uh, communication from the recipient to the, uh, to the broadcaster yeah, also. Um, in, in the 90s, Stadtwerkstatt was uh, founded the Free Radio Fro. It's a free uh, broadcast station, radio broadcast station, and an independent, uh, uh, independent net provider, ServiceAT. Uh, this year, we are, and this year, we are, with the fifth time, we are, making a show Stadtwerkstatt 48, is 48 hours uh, art, net art and something else. Yeah. And we're starting on Friday, tomorrow at 6, till Sunday at 6. We have invited 40 artists to show different things and we have talks all the night and you can eat all the night and uh, we are not under the topic von Ars Electronica, we are separated, we are autonomous, we have our own topic and our topic is stay unfinished. 
I want to invite you to, to come to us and see our, our things. Yeah. In front of the Stadtwerkstatt, you, you can find the Stadtwerkstatt uh, very easy. Yeah. It's uh, on the place from, from Ars Electronica. Yeah. There you can see a big antenna. Yeah. It's really a big antenna. We are looking to the stars and uh, receiving the stars. There's one star. Uh, we want to re uh, receive uh, him. It, uh, it's, it was sending out the, the emissions 40 years ago, and now it's, it's coming to the earth. Yeah. Good. Um, I want to invite you for tomorrow, yeah, and thank you. Please. It's a star, it's a, it's a normal star, and a hydrogen, where we are receiving the hydrogen emission of the stars, yeah. Uh, I, uh, if you have time, I can bring you back at the beginning of the... Uh, no? Okay. Thank you, Thank you much. Yeah. Okay. I need this slide up, please. Uh, my name is Vuk. I'm uh, connected to the word net art in a way that I am the one making was the one doing the actual art here, and Josephine was a journalist uh, and a punk theoretician that was very impressively important at the time, and Andreas as a, as a facilitator and thinker, so we created a bit of, an, uh, of a space, and Andreas is now playing with his computer, and con Command L. Command L, please. All right, and I have decided to be the one to, to do the sentencing here. This is my sentence. I have uh, uh, understood that my job as a host is to be nice and uh, play in the background, but then I remember this is like the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and I'm the only one with a guitar. Man, these guys are only you know, facilitators and I said, fuck you, I'm gonna do some art. And anyway, this is a little bit of a contribution to the 40th anniversary of this uh, new media retirement home here. Um, this is, a posi this is how I understand, I mean, I'm, we're of the same age group, I'm 50 plus, don't take this as an insult, I'm looking at a few guys even older than me. So, uh, we're on the same boat, okay. So, uh, when I was thinking, what's my position? I, I've been, you know, I've been marinated in this net art thing for all this time, and it's a bit boring to play, you know, the same songs from the first album over and over again. Um, I want to share this with you. Uh, this is my sentence. Tikkun olam is some Jewish thing. It's a family thing. And it is this Bronze Age uh, ethics platform. It's Paleokant, which is spelled with a K. K-A-N-T, please, everyone. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's this idea that every gesture you make has to contain a component of you willingly fixing the world. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good concept. Uh, uh, but that's, that's supposed to be the grounds, the, the granite fundamental position. But then there's this Oppenheimer Knödel. I deliberately had Knödel last night uh, uh, just to honor this sentencing here. Um, you see, we, in that other field of physics, uh, there's been this Manhattan project run by this guy Oppenheimer. They came up with a solution which was fantastically applicable. This guy saw the application of that solution and had a remark. I appreciate the remark that Oppenheimer had about the nuclear bomb very much, and I I am noticing that in our arena that is supposed to be, let's say, technology slash computing, we did not have the Oppenheimer figure understanding that, whoops, we have created a monster. And for me as an archaeologist and an art artist, this is an important deficit to be aware of. Uh, at my time, the early uh, web, uh, web, you know, browser-based art was all about the space of freedom. And if you ask kids today, the internet is a space of fear. And something happened in the meantime, right? Uh, so I think that's the Oppenheimer Knödel. And, so, and this is the antipode, the, the, the other animal I keep in my mind when I think of this shit. And Brodello, of course, because I like word games. Uh, uh, it's important to observe also our field through the long durée, uh, through the mechanism of uh, understanding the slightly bigger paradigm shifts and it's 
I think worthy of note is that there hasn't been a one since the 60s, and we keep uh, running in the same treadmill, and it is especially depressing to see uh, glorious heroes from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s actually repeating the same story, you know, like a Groundhog Day of preoccupations of critical media art, never moving a pixel, and it's quite spooky, and I, I beg you, kids, younger people in this room, uh, never mind this depressing message of us senior citizens, uh, try to nevertheless stick to what you're doing, like you already heard before. It's only about passion and talent, and the fame will follow or not. Fuck that. So that's it. These were the words of, you know, Jimi Hendrix that failed to overdose. I'm still alive, which is a mistake. And I salute you in my own name and nobody else's. Goodbye. Uh, short, uh, I have here the program for the Stadtwerkstatt, and I, I put it on the chair here. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. La, 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 la. Maybe we can already have them here for later for if somebody wants to discuss. Okay. Maybe. Who is the translator? Okay, she will sit. She will sit with. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe you sit here, I sit here, so I will call you first. Oh, of course. We need a seat, another seat. Oh. Ah, but we need one more. One more. One more seat. Um, we need one more seat. 
Can you show me your name? <laughs> Uh, you could move a bit over to me ah. and we make one more space for yeah. Tabaguchi yeah. Center. Left, right, middle, center. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You want to be Saigo last time? Yeah, yeah okay. Last one, yeah. Last one, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I will step over here. Okay. Um. Can we start? So, uh, welcome everybody. I'm very happy to be here. We are uh, 10 minutes late. I think all the sessions are 10 minutes late. But uh, we uh, have about an hour, I was told. So I'm very happy to be here uh, to moderate a panel on Japanese media art in History Summit. And as you can see, there are many Japanese uh, experts here, except myself. I'm not Japanese, as you can see. <laughs> and you wonder probably why am I moderating this panel, but I will tell you in a minute. So we have a very fantastic speakers here, Mashiko Kusahara who is going to talk about the history and prehistory of Japanese media art. Minoru Hatanaka, who is here, uh, who will speak about ICC's role in promoting and exhibiting Japanese media art. Then we have uh, expert curator Yukiko Shikata, who will talk about Canon Art Lab here. We have uh, Professor Sekiguchi here, uh, also old friend, who is going to talk about media art education in Japan and some uh, kind of history line about Japanese media art. And we have also a very famous artist, media artist and pioneer, Yuichiro Kawaguchi here, who is going to talk about his role as a media art pioneer and educator. Uh, so why am I moderating this panel? Uh, I have to say, uh, in the previous uh, talks we heard uh, from Gerfried and also from uh, Peter Weibel, about the out of control uh, exhibition as Ars Electronica in 1991. And I have to say, Laurent Mignonot and me, uh, well, Laurent, my artistic partner, we have been here in 1991 and we were very lucky to see this amazing exhibition, Ars Electronica Festival, and it also inspired us a lot to do art. Just one year later, in 1993, we already exhibited at Ars Electronica. Uh, a work that you can see here with plants and it made apparently quite a good impact that the year later in 94 we already got the golden nika and we were really very lucky and very young and also thanks to er Erki Hutamo and many other friends uh, we already succeeded quite early to get a lot of media attention thanks to the golden nika and also thanks to us electronica and how is this connected to us electronica I think it was Mashiko Kusahara and also Professor Sakane, whom I am, uh, heard that we will talk about him later on. He was one of the very first moderators and curators and really important figure in Japanese media art. He discovered us here and he, together with many other friends in Japan, invited us to go to Japan and uh, there was a long-term collaboration with NTT ICC started. We had our first show in Japan in 94 at the gallery. I think this was before ICC was founded and Minoru Hatanaka will tell us more, tell us more about uh, ICC. Uh, we also at that time was quite involved in artificial life, which was a very hot topic in the news. You can't even believe you know, how, how much attention it had. NHK television was reporting it. Uh, newspaper articles were published about uh, A-life art, artificial life, genetic algorithms, and so forth. And all this was like a really big, big movement. And we will hear from uh, Minoru Hatanaka more about ICC. We have exhibited there. We have some works in their collections. And every uh, other year or so, we have been re-invited back. And it's a very long time uh, collaboration with ICC. We have also been educators, and here comes in uh, Professor Sekiguchi, who together with Sakane-san invited us uh, to teach at Yamas. And 
Sekiguchi-san was actually our boss for many years and one of the best bosses we ever had. <laughs> and so thanks again for being here. And I hope that we will hear a lot about uh, Japanese media art history today. I think you will really be filled with a lot of top know-how here by our experts. And maybe we have time to answer or at least discuss about some of these questions. I know they are too much for one, for one hour, but hopefully we can go back to some of these issues uh, later on. So let me now introduce our first speaker, Mashiko Kusahara. Uh, she is, uh, was a professor at the, uh, yeah, at, just a moment, just put at Waseda University. Oh, sorry, that's, that's not the first one. Mashiko, 40 years here. Yes, I will, I will put it up, don't worry. Just a moment, okay, some technical issue here. Okay, yeah, it's just we have the mouse. Where's the mouse here? Okay. Okay, Moment. This is the Sigmund nicht gescheit. Ich sehe mit dem Brillen nicht so gut. Yeah, sorry, my eyes are, you know, that's the pleasure of getting old. Okay. <laughs> Full screen. Okay, here we are. So please, Mashiko, tell us more about. Uh, yes. I think you have to watch this screen here yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's not okay. uh, not visible here. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Krista, for interesting. I'm so happy, more than happy, to be here for this anniversary for the 40 years. And uh, so there we kind of say our talks are to be kind of say. Uh, how to say, continuous in a way, but also overlapping a little bit because of the nature of the talk. And so I'm mostly focusing on how, introducing how Japanese media art started to grow uh, with kind of historical aspect. So, and uh, I was, the idea here is also that we talk about that from our, also a personal point of view, the personal experience. So I briefly uh, show how I came into this field. And interestingly, my, um, how to say, uh, the uh, introduction to, to media technology came in just 40, 40 years ago, in 1979. It was a time when a Japanese uh, composer, since, uh, musician, Tomita Isao, did his first electronic uh, opera in Tokyo. And so it was done with the images uh, created by um, those people, Tom DeFanti and those other others, who were also the founders of Seagraph Electronic Theater. And that was a time so through someone I knew, I was taken to the demo of this uh, Zigras real-time graphic software, which was very interesting for me. And by then, so I was asked to um, do something with uh, SIGGRAPH, this computer graphics, and it started in 1983 that I started uh, the SIGGRAPH Tokyo office and became kind of introduced to many people uh, in this field, of course, including Yojiro Kawaguchi. And also, the, uh, I was involved in this um, uh, traveling art show of animation SIGGRAPH, uh, the, uh, from SIGGRAPH, and also to show the uh, co curate the uh, animation program for this science exposition in Tsukuba in 85. So that's how I kind of started working here. And then, so the, uh, this kind of works developed into not only computer graphics, but in the field of media art as the technology, like interactive technology, kind of started to appear and it became possible to, for many artists to use. And as like, you could see, I was involved in the, uh, uh, the first program to, for the uh, uh, media art section of Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Photography, uh, which then was kind of say, uh, headed by Tomoe Moriyama, the curator who is here, <laughs> and, uh, which became a major venue for showing media art, including Christian Rand's work. And then also the, I joined the uh, first um, part of the activities to do the research for the launching ICC. It was first, it's a kind of say, a research group. And I also uh, helped its Osaka's exhibition. And so I came to Sonica because I was at SIGGRAPH every year. And that means that I met Christian, Christine Schoff and Hannes Leopold Seder every year. And Christine, um, 
said, so he, she really persuaded me that I have to come to Alice Technica. I was already in Europe to uh, curate computer animation and knew that what we knew about new media art from America was very different from what you could see in Europe. Kind of different taste. And I was really happy so that she took me here. So it kind of uh, changed also what I could do in Japan. And also, as Chris was mentioning, in Japan, it was a time when Sakane has already started writing on the, uh, as a kind of, he was a journalist on Asahi newspaper and writing regularly every Sunday for the special issue of the newspaper about science, technology, and art. And it was very influential. I used to clip everything he wrote. And there are many other people like that. And because in Japan, there's this tradition that newspaper companies sponsor art exhibitions. So Sakane could organize many uh, exhibitions related to the science and art. So he, in the beginning, so it was mainly holography and optical illusions, which were kind of a popular topic by then. And definitely with the uh, arrival of uh, digital technology and more artists using uh, computer, so it shifted to media art. And you already saw it briefly. So just last week, uh, he sent me this message and a photo taken by his daughter just a week ago. So I can read. Hello everyone, I'm Itzo Sakane. Congratulations for the 40 years anniversary of Earth Electronica. It is my great pleasure to have participated and followed the history of Earth Electronica as a journalist and a freelance writer for such a long time, since the beginning of the 1990s until the recent years. I hope Earth Electronica will successfully continue for a long time from now on. Although it might be difficult for me to visit Ars Electronica again because of my physical condition due to my age, I will follow the successful news about the Ars Electronica through the electronic news. Best wishes, Itzo Sakane. So I'm very grateful that he sent a message. So as you can see, that he will turn into uh, 90 next year. And he is still in a high speed. Well, so I would talk very briefly about the history of Japanese media art, but you will also see images from uh, Professor Sekiguchi's uh, project later. So what is important for me is the rise of Japanese media art was supported by this basis already founded in the 1950s and 60s, soon after the war. So the uh, group of avant-garde artists like uh, Experimental Workshop, and Gutai, which is known in Europe very widely, uh, have already used technology uh, to create their works. And uh, that was also followed by the 60s and 70s intermedia kind of current. So the, this cross-talk intermedia would be also presented by uh, Sekiguchi-san. And by 60s, uh, in the middle of 60s, already uh, computer art started. Also, you will hear about that. And these um, came to one kind of, how to say, node in 1970 at the Osaka World Exposition. And by then, artists were those people who had the visions, who could do some interesting things. So they were invited to create some rather crazy pavilions, or pavilions really kind of say involved uh, latest technologies. Uh, you can see this in, uh, name is here. But what happened was, uh, after this expo, extremely very popular and that uh, collected, attracted many people, when the expo is over, the artists, many of them, decided it was not exactly what they wanted to do. They felt like their ideas, their technology, were consumed by the industry, by the power. So what they started was to be involved in media education and also create this video collective to use the new technology for the society to raise, raise a conversation between people using this new media. And it is very important. So I don't think I can do all that. So anyway, when our Electronica started, it was the time these things have happened. Sakane was create, uh, curating the exhibitions and Isao Tomita's Electro Opera started, which was directed 
by a science fiction author, uh, Sakio Komatsu, who was a visionary. And I don't have enough time, but so you will have a glimpse of what I mentioned. So these are some kind of more detailed information. This experimental workshop is very important and has been attracting more attention in Japan. There have been uh, exhibitions and publications about this and uh, how they used the kind of latest technologies. So sorry to go very quickly. And the Gutai group. So uh, they became internationally known, uh, but even and before that, or rather, in the, their first uh, years, they did more experimental thing because uh, their young artists uh, were offered the chance to do a very big open-air exhibition. So they used cheaper materials. It just made big things. They invited people to come in and join. And, uh, but after those exhibitions, they just threw, out, threw away the things because they didn't have any space to. Um, keep those things. And this group of I think you uh, see some names familiar to Arce Electronica, like Yasunao Tone or Takisa Kosugi. So the uh, young uh, musicians, music students, uh, were very much active in these uh, activities. And these people, which will also continue with Fruxas movement, uh, they had this venue, uh, Sogetsu Art Center, created originally uh, in the connection of Sogetsu Flower Arrangement School. And that became the place where also other activities like experimental animation and other things happened, and also artists met. So to make it very brief, so that is what was happening in the 1970s. And it was then also, in the, the end of the 1970s, that plastic art and mixed media program uh, started at Tsukuba University, from which artists like Toshio Yuai and Meiwa Denki uh, have uh, graduated. But I want another kind of very important thing was computer graphics in the 1980s. Uh, Yojiro Kawaguchi already started much earlier, and you will hear from him. But so, my part of my background was in computer graphics in the 80s. And uh, it was a new tool. It was not just a kind of uh, tool to make interesting animation or visual effects as many young people would think now. It was a new medium to see new possibilities and also to deal with new ideas about space and time by then. And so when Yoichiro Kawaguchi and Masaki Fujihata, I think many of you know his works as uh, kind of in the interactive artworks, when both of them uh, showed their works at Seagraph, I think it was starting with Kawaguchi's work and uh, close with Fujiata's work. So it was a big shock almost to the computer graphics community in the States. They didn't know that such things was happening in Japan. And it also helped rise of computer graphics community in Japan. And this Nikograph, this Computer Graphics Association, actually became a basis later for the Japan Media Arts Festival. And you can see, because Kawaguchi san will be showing his work, I just brought some images from Masaki Fujihata's mandala. A very clear image using ray tracing. Oh, sorry. But the thing started to change around 1985. So with computer graphics, images are always kept in the screen, in the computer. And as Ishii-san was saying, so how to make it tangible? How to make it physical? That was a big question. And only around eight, nine, 18, 1985, it became possible, and young artists started exper kind of experimenting. Uh, Toshio Iwa is one of them. So the arrival of personal computer and the graphic software was a key to that process. And because of that, artists from uh, different backgrounds, painting, illustration, design, photography, and so they came to this field and they collaborated with the software engineers who were also interested in creating something artistic. And another thing which happened was, um, like the Minitel in France, 
uh, so we had yeah, a VBS system, personal computer network system. And artists started to collaborate uh, doing network projects. So you can see, like, Toshio Iwa's early work already in 1985. And this is Fujihata's geometric graph. So out of the 3D model, using this uh, factory system, he created a big sculpture. This that you can do it with a 3D comp uh, the printer, but it was a big issue by then. Oh, sorry. And also, the, uh, the schools opening and the venues, like Kano Art Lab, I think Yukiko Shikata would talk about. So now, there are, by, by then, there are many chances for young artists to see their works and also show their works. And if they are interested, they could learn how to do that. And also in 1997, Japan Media Arts Festival started, and it gave a big opportunities for artists to see and create and uh, debut, make a debut. And Kange, uh, by Ch Kyoko Kuno, who must be somewhere here, <laughs> she'll be speaking, uh, was the, the first piece that won the grand prize at this first uh, exhibition. And I'm very proud, actually. I was a person who nominated this work, I have to say. Well, I don't think I have enough time, but so what I saw was, it's going, yeah, sorry, I'm out of time. Yeah, there are many things happening, and that made me think about, so why there are some interesting kind of features in Japanese media art? So being a jury member for Arasa Electronica, Puri Arasa Electronica, really gave me a kind of chance to think about that. Sometimes during this uh, conversation, some other jury member said, it's too playful. It doesn't look serious. Is it bad to, be, to look playful? But it's important to have layers. Under this kind of playful uh, surface, it can be, there can be some serious themes. So uh, that led me to devise out this project, uh, which uh, we have a small exhibition there. And there has been a publication. I published a lot in English. So if you're interested, please visit Device Art. And, so, and uh, it's kind of maybe give some idea about Japanese media art. Thank you very much. Hello. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much uh, for uh, your nice uh, overview, Mashiko Kusaran. I, I'm sure, as you notice, there would be so many topics that we could discuss about whether there is a difference between Western art and maybe Asian art or specifically Japanese art. And one of the very good uh, experts in this field is Minoru Hatanaka, who uh, has been involved at NTT ICC. It's a very nice center, a bit like Ars Electronica Center, but more of a museum, but also sponsoring a lot and promoting media arts since many years. And I think uh, Minoru, we met already in the early 90s when we started yeah. to get involved uh, in uh, Japan. Late, late 90s. In late 90s. And you will tell us uh, now more about uh, the role of ICC in promoting media art in Japan. Uh, so, uh, so, my name is Minoru Hatanaka from uh, NTT Intercommunication Center, ICC. So, I'm very pleased to be here so for uh, 40 years anniversary of uh, Alice Electronica. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, uh, just now, uh, Kusahara-san uh, introduced an uh, overview of Japanese media history. So, uh, I uh, would like to introduce uh, just our uh, center's activity. So, um, <coughs> ICC is uh, running by NTT East Corporation now, but uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, NTT uh, company is uh, one of the major telecommunication company in Japan. Uh, run, uh, Learning uh, cultural uh, facilities. So uh, since since 1997, uh, I'm working in ICC uh, since 1996, uh, over 20 years. So before the opening of ICC. So um, <coughs> yeah, just now uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our center. So uh, ICC is a. Uh, um, Center for um, so-called media art, but uh, uh, broad, um, broad range of uh, 
art uh, topic uh, we uh, we are uh, showing uh, as a exhibition or uh, more kind of like a, a art activity. So, um, <coughs> sorry. So, uh, and uh, <coughs> I'd like to uh, introduce some uh, activities uh, by uh, our website. So, because. Uh, in this uh, website, so many uh, kind of uh, archives uh, on the uh, our website, so you can see uh, our activity uh, over 20 years. So, but uh, uh, we are established in 1997, but uh, our activities uh, started from 1991, uh, just uh, online project. So this is a uh, uh, sorry, uh, this one. So this is uh, Intercommunication 91, the museum inside the telephone network. It's the first activity of ICC. So it's uh, using a telephone network. Uh, it's a, a pre-internet uh, era. So uh, just the uh, first, uh, not first, so, but uh, um, mostly the first uh, using telephone network event, online event in Japan. So. Um, the uh, first activity is an uh, uh, online project. So that's why uh, we are uh, more like focusing uh, on the internet activity. So next project is uh, Intercommunication 95, uh, on, uh, named On the Web, the museum inside the network. So uh, that, um, in, in between in the two events, so um, internet uh, raised in uh, uh, Japan, uh, mostly uh, around the 1992 or three. So, um, <clears throat> under 1995, it's a um, kind of like a, a, a internet, uh, so-called in Japanese internet, Gannen, it's the first uh, year of the internet. So, uh, we uh, held uh, uh, inter online event on, on named on the web. So, uh, this is a main, in, in this uh, uh, website, so many, uh, online uh, work uh, exists. But uh, uh, um, the session uh, before, uh, on online uh, the session, uh, the member told, told uh, most of the uh, online project now uh, became a, a dead link. So uh, <laughs> at, at the same, uh, at the station is the same, uh, most of the uh, online uh, content now is dead link. But, uh, uh, some of them uh, still uh, can see uh, by name, uh, but uh, most of them are maybe dead link. So uh, one, um, one of uh, uh, so this one, this one is a uh, uh, Kazuhiko Hachiya, the uh, online project, so Mega Diary. So it's a uh, uh, pre-blog uh, era, so uh, no one, uh, can use uh, on web by di for diary. So, but uh, uh, this project uh, is uh, um, 100 members of the uh, <coughs> Hachiya san's uh, colleagues, 100 members wrote a diary so, and uh, reading uh, each other. So, this is a pre blog era network project, online project. So, this kind of uh, <coughs> online project showed in uh, on, on the web project. So this is uh, maybe the first uh, major uh, online project in Japan. So, uh, and, uh, yes. Uh, this one is uh, uh, um, our uh, archive, online archive named Hype. So this is a uh, 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 on, online archive. Uh, so you can see the, uh, our activities. Uh, uh, um, for by by via internet, so mostly uh, around 20 years of uh, ICC's activity. So uh, this one, uh, this one is uh, uh, so it, this is a legendary session. <laughs> so um, so we invite uh, Barbara London from uh, New York, and uh, we talk uh, asking. Uh, the talk of the uh, Shuya Abe, so he's a living legend of Japanese media. <laughs> so uh, this kind of uh, perspective we have. So um, our activities uh, mostly uh, so um, recent uh, uh, latest uh, media project, introducing latest media project, but uh, also uh, the perspective of the uh, long his history of media or technology or 
electronic cloud. So we had uh, we have a uh, uh, broad range of uh, activities. So uh, this is is a contest con contents of the our uh, in uh, archives. So this is a um, um, yes. So annually uh, making some uh, document, uh, so you can see the, uh, our uh, annual. Uh, so and uh, also this is the uh, contents of the interviews of the artists or critics. So you can see uh, um, many uh, artists interviews, uh, artists critics or uh, architects someone. So uh, mostly uh, other contents, over uh, 100 uh, contents you can see by uh, internet. But uh, uh, more than uh, more uh, contents you can see uh, by uh, in, in the ICC. So because of the uh, copyright problem. So and uh, also this is a uh, media chronology. Uh, so it's a uh, uh, so. Um, media uh, chronology, so uh, each uh, inside of the uh, contents linked to the, uh, our website. So you can see the uh, um, photos. So easy to uh, access to our uh, exhibitions. Uh, and uh, uh, looking for the uh, explanation or something. Mm. Yeah, so some others. So, uh, and uh, also, uh, we have uh, Emerging Artists uh, program, so named Emergencies, uh, since 2006. So, uh, every year, so two or three artists featured uh, every year. So, now uh, mostly 40, uh, nearly 40 artists introduced and uh, support uh, young artists. So, uh, yes, so this is uh, uh, other con content, uh, other events. In, so, for example, this is a two, uh, 2014 uh, program. So, this is uh, uh, many uh, people uh, <coughs> participated. So, Papa London, David Toop, and the Living Legend, also uh, Michael Snow. So, and uh, Eki Hutan. So, many uh, guests uh, come from the foreign, uh, foreign country. So and also net artists, uh, all who can stay, they also come to ICC and uh, doing uh, having a lecture. So uh, and uh, so, sorry, so recent uh, exhibition. So I would like to uh, introduce. Uh, this is a uh, uh, last uh, year's uh, special exhibition. It's a uh, uh, tema. It's a game, a video game. So uh, uh, in in a gamescape. So this is a. Uh, <coughs> Um, making an exhibition with uh, guest curators. So uh, it's a game uh, exhibition for uh, a recent indie game scene and uh, a video game art exhibition. And also uh, every year, now we had every year uh, um, annually exhibition, so named Open Space. So uh, especially in 2017, uh, we have a tema of the uh, reinvention Envisioning the future. So this is a uh, uh, most ne nearly uh, our acti tema of the, our activity. Uh, so, uh, hi. Uh, so uh, quickly <laughs> introducing uh, our, our center. So um, yeah, just finish. Uh, so because uh, time is <laughs> uh, no, over, over, over timing. So. Uh, so just the uh, ICC is an uh, introduction. So, uh, <clears throat> so please uh, come to ICC if you, you can uh, travel to uh, Tokyo. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Hatanaka-san. I think as you can see, uh, there would be so many more things to show and to talk about. And it's a pity that we have so little time but uh, ICC's role, of course, uh, in the promotion of media art is extremely important. And uh, I think just to avoid a misunderstanding, it's not only promoting Japanese media artists, but it's actually also uh, quite international. So I think especially in the open space exhibitions, you had um, 
just a moment. I'm trying to multitask here. Uh, you also had uh, many other artists from other, other countries, isn't it? Or maybe you want to talk about the international contribution that um, it's often also very international exhibitions in Uh, so, yes, uh, every year, so we invite uh, um, many artists from the, uh, all around the world. Uh, so, um, not only from Japan, uh, so Asian country, so uh, the Europe and US. So, uh, this, this year's uh, ICC's exhibition so focused on the Asian artists, um, mostly uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, recently, I researching the Southeast Asian country, so I um, so visited uh, many uh, uh, some art center. So um, maybe some collaborative project in, with uh, some other countries. Yeah. Um, so please let me introduce the next speaker, Yukiko Shikata, a curator based in Tokyo and has been for many years curator of Canon Art Lab, uh, who has also sponsored media art for many, many years. She was also a curator at Mori Art Center, a very nice museum in uh, Tokyo, and worked as curator for NTT ICC and also recently uh, curated a show at the Sapporo Art Museum. So please, Yukiko, tell us from your point of view about 30 years of media art in Japan. Hi, um, this is Yukiko Shikata. Nice to meet you all. And today I want to uh, speak about uh, my 30 years experience as a media curator. And uh, it's more, more uh, like uh, my personal perspective, my experience. So please, uh, I hope it will be, uh, it will contribute some of the uh, understanding of Japanese arts, media arts. So through curatorial investigation, 1989, 30 years ago, was the year for me very important because uh, personally, actually, I got involved to uh, media art more intensively and from the beginning of 1990. And uh, when I was in Berlin, uh, Berlin Wall fell down in November, then also uh, in Japan, the new era, Heisei, started in Japan. Now, after 30 years, new era and Reiwa. So it's just around 30 years. And also starting point of kind of media art as an interactive art. Uh, one of the important figures is Jeffrey Shaw with the, the work Legible City, also 1989. And 1990, September, my first bid is to ask Electronico like Machiko did. So we are the same debut. <laughs> we have the same debut at the Arts Electronica. Tema was digital and dreams and virtual world. And it was a very interesting impact. For me, it was also the first time to be in the European Media Festival. So it's no, not only showing around, but also more theoretical investigation and symposiums, academic also flavors, and also bringing the new um, dream, science, science fiction dreams from West Coast with virtual reality, Jaron Lanier, all that kind of people are there. So it's, it was a very strong impact for me. So I want to uh, introduce by time by time, early 1990s, company led the production, production exhibition of media art, like entity ICC, and also Canon company was interested in having a new art support pro program of media art, Canon Art Lab, but actually Canon was very good in digital image processing, still pictures. So I and the other curator, Kazuno Abe, activated uh, to make more experimental work, including interactive art. But it was also uh, in ex my, my experience of uh, Architonica 1990. Then we thought it's important to launch a new uh, interactive uh, experimental works from Japan. And later 1990s, diffusion of personal and computers, internet, interactive works connecting to the internet emerged. And Shiseido, maybe it's uh, famous uh, as a cosmetic company, Shiseido and uh, Signet, Cyber Gallery Network, introducing experimental net and software arts started 1998. 
So I want to introduce briefly, maybe I cannot explain about the each work, but this is the first interactive piece by using this technology out of Open Collaboration 1993, like brainwave writer, like using the EBA brainwave interface to, how to say, to detect human brain, brain changes, brainwave changes, or some other conceptual based interactive piece. And the uh, first uh, interactive piece from, from Canon Art Lab came in 1993 with Ulrike Gabriel, German-based uh, artist, part of Jarina, trying to uh, artistically experiment uh, up to virtual reality. And uh, the Canon's engineer also developed their own technique and skills um, year by year. And Art Lab 4 with Teiji Furuhashi, lovers, and uh, this was uh, tours worldwide and uh, became a collection of MoMA, New York, 1998. And uh, Seiko Mikami's work, uh, we have the uh, Seiko Mikami's work uh, in 1995 and 1996. And it, uh, these works are uh, mutually connected. And out of five, 1995, and uh, we launched the Molecular Clinic. It's uh, the work that you can download a program to culture. Then you can upload again, and the virtual spider will be changed by the, uh, and, uh, a huge amount of users. But it is very early, so it is not so easy by the connection. And uh, also, Seiko Mikami uh, participated the ICC on the web at the same time. So we had uh, some uh, connection with each other. And this was the first year of making uh, experimental net art in Japan. And uh, this is uh, eye tracking based interactive piece by uh, Seiko Mikami, 1996 spring. After uh, half a year, we uh, developed uh, further for two particip participants. So there came a communication aspect of two participants. Then, a uh, robotic research tendencies, questioning urbanity in 1997, and uh, it uh, was uh, got a uh, uh, golden nickel in uh, 1998. Here, from here, we had the installation connected with the internet. And 1998, also, this is a work by uh, connecting internet. And then, the artist was Koichiro Eto, and uh, each robot has a sound. Sound can be uh, sent by the each users, then uh, by, by via interface. And each robot moving around randomly starts to exchange the sound. So whole uh, interactive environment, the sound environment will be changed. And uh, Atsuhito Sekiguchi's piece, uh, at out of nine. Uh, this is dealing with uh, the human body and the virtual body, and, uh, and the visitor can uh, uh, get uh, sensed by the different kind of sensors, and this data will be uh, sent to uh, appear, the virtual bodies. And this is the last piece by uh, artists and computer in engineers, uh, Carl San Nicola and Marco Perihan. Marco Perihan is here in this postal city with his uh, one of the new piece, Polar. And uh, this uh, work got the Golden Nika 2001, but was, uh, unfortunately we couldn't uh, exhibit this piece. But uh, this piece. Uh, was dealing with the, uh, like uh, data analyzation and the Google uh, search engines and also a kind of uh, very um, primary kind of artificial life uh, aspect. And uh, we had also a prospect exhibition introducing existing uh, important work from abroad. And we have totally five exhibitions, including Christian Miller's virtual cage, who are also dealing with AI and literature, Daniel Alina Playbest, Ultima Radio. And the last piece, and actually the last exhibition by Art Lover 2001 in June, uh, Michelle Saub and the Supreme Particles. Also, this is a kind of, kind of Gesamtkunst work of interactive piece at that time. It's a very advanced piece. Then also there was a kind of spin-off, not out of the kind of art lab, and the same curator um, made a, a, a new installation by Christian Mela at Spiral. Now, and Signet. This is a, a 
Ned Gary. So maybe I have to finish soon. Yeah, this is uh, Tyra Hungary and some other piece, 98. Then uh, 2000 zeros, zero zeros, Media Art expanded to city, daily lives, and Yamaguchi Center for Art and Media opened 2003. And contemporary museums interest to media art and media to various expressions, including bio art. Then uh, we had a project to Kingdom Parashi with uh, Shurin Chen and also Armin Merush. And the uh, opening project of WICAM uh, with Raphael Rosenhammer. And uh, Exonimo's Natural Process when I was working as a curator of Moriat Museum. Then, first uh, exhibition at the ICC, as the ICC curator of Open Nature and Connecting World and some other exhibitions. And the bus project, um, maybe, it, uh, yeah. And also, the, one of the projects uh, of Mobile Up um, by Exonimo won the Golden Nika 2006. And the ICC. Then, 2010. After 3.11, um, the, um, we uh, started to rethink the modernity in Japan. Then the situation has changed, and also media diffused to art festivals and local communities. And also later 10th, archive and preservation of media art is getting very crucial. So this is the polar at Wycombe and some uh, exhibition dealing with water, energy, and money, all dealing with the information flows, and the Sapporo International Art Festival dealing with uh, some uh, environmental sensing and visualizations. And uh, Ibarra Kenpoku uh, Art Festival 2016, also dealing with bioart. And my, uh, as me as a director, Amit Festival. And uh, on the last point, this one, the uh, work by Seiko Mikami made in 1996, was after 11 years reproduced by Wycom. But uh, because of the change, drastic change of technology, and the artists changed the name, name of the work from uh, molecular informatics to eye tracking informatics. And uh, actually, we are facing to the archiving issues these days. So this is uh, one of the crucial issues after 30 years of media art in Japan. Now, uh, 2018, research on company Mesana uh, to media arts started. And now we are preserving and archiving some, uh, some, some uh, documents of Art Lab and Shiseido Signet and Spiral Wakawa Center and research is continued 2019. So this is the last uh, slide. So future perspective, keep on my investigation for the future by locating media art as a poetic possibility traversing various information flows and uh, for, the fact, uh, for the actual engagement of human and beyond AI, animals, creatures, and things in the universe, including micro and macro. So I'm thinking about the media art, or new uh, artistic possibility, not only for human beings, but for other creatures. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yukiko. Um, our next speaker is Professor Sekiguchi from Aichi uh, University, and uh, I think uh, Yukiko just mentioned the project that he in, is involved in, in archiving, and Professor Sekiguchi is an artist, but also an educator. He was president of the Yamas Institute, which was founded by Professor Sukane, and later led uh, by Professor Sekiguchi. And, um, uh -huh, the mirror display. Maybe we need the mirror display. And uh, or maybe you can just drag the... And we will have also a translator. I know we are a bit running out of time, but on the other hand, we started 10 minutes later. So it's not our fault if we finish a bit later. So let's please give the time to Sekiguchi-san and then please stay here. Uh, Kabaguchi-san will also uh, show you later something. So please. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to arrive here. Uh, I have a, a, a campus exhibition too. Uh, please check out uh, Aichi University of the Art 
space <laughs> too. Uh, this time, I ex explained the uh, uh, Japanese media art timeline infographics project and uh, interface of the, the educational and academic relationship of artist and researcher in Japan. Uh, because uh, two projects, I have an exhibition uh, at the uh, rooftop floor. Please, after check out. Uh, well, uh, this project, uh, the, uh, I make the infographics, uh, uh, media art uh, uh, activity uh, from 1950 to 2020. I divide uh, uh, media art activity uh, into three categories. Uh, red ribbon is, uh, red color is festival series, uh, blue color is group collective, uh, green color is uh, institution and organization. Maybe it, you can uh, look out the uh, uh, six turning point. Uh, I explained the uh, six turning point uh, in Japanese uh, uh, media art uh, timeline. Uh, it's fast. Uh, from the 1950s to the 1960s, movies and the film were utilized to create exper experimental expressions under the concept of expanded spaces and uh, theatrical th theories. For example, uh, this uh, photo is an experimental workshop in Japanese at uh, Jikken Kobo. Uh, Jikken Kobo uh, using the many media and uh, art uh, method uh, performance, film projection, sounds, and uh, uh, mixed uh, media, uh, uh, they began a uh, new type uh, project. I think the uh, Jiken Kobo is uh, ordinal uh, of Japan media art. Second, uh, since cross-talk intermedia in 1969 and uh, Osaka World Expo in 1970, expression using with new media such as video and computer had been developed. For example, the CTG uh, drawing computing Next, uh, uh, middle the uh, cross-talk intermedia event at uh, Yogi National uh, Gymnasium. Uh, so many people and musicians and uh, uh, filmmaker and uh, performer, it, uh, two, uh, only two days uh, used uh, this space. Uh, but uh, so many performances uh, they did. Next, uh, right is uh, Osaka Exposition. Uh, this is uh, Nakaya, Fujiko Nakaya uh, installation. Third, from the early 1980s, video and personal computer production equipment became common. Consequently, many artists, including young artists, began to create and present video art works and digital art works. For example, the Sony building sometimes uh, have uh, many events and exhibitions. And, uh, 
in first Fushi my international seminar uh, at computer age symposium technology art and art. Uh, many international uh, composer, uh, modern composer and uh, media artist uh, discussed this symposium. Fourth, from the mid-1980s, media art festival and exhibition became active due to uh, corporate support of the art and culture, Mesena, uh, said in Japan. At the same time, artists started applying information technology to artwork. For example, the, uh, Japan, we have the Tsukuda, Tsukuba Exposition. Uh, many uh, new type media uh, presentation there is. And uh, uh, in Spira, uh, Second Video Television Festival, uh, this organized uh, Nakaya Fumiko uh, at Gallery Scan. And uh, Shikata san explained to Art Lab, uh, she and Abe san curated uh, at first Art Lab. Uh, Kodai Nakahara, data machine is a connect couple, at a pulse of couple, uh, change to the eh, turn the light and the sound and uh, influence to interior. Light and art lab lovers too. Fifth, from the mid 1990s, many new educational research institutes for information engineering and art were established. The internet infrastructure spread rapidly. Pre of Art Electronica and Media Art Festival of Agency for Cultural Affairs. Uh, launches and activities by media artists would become more apparent. Uh, 1996, uh, Get Golden Nika, uh, Masaki Fujihata san, uh, Global Interior Project. And Iwata san, he is not. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Five minutes left. I was told. Maybe we can switch to Kabakuchi san. Last slide. Last slide. Okay. Twenty zero. Not only art, but also entertainment and design expanded expression mm -hmm. original in media art history become recognized, especially such activities by small creative groups and getting powerful and now the next generation in emerging. For example, Mihara-san, Ekisonimo, Daitom Manabe. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have time, unfortunately, but mm. I think we got a really good overview of the timeline of uh, Japanese media art history. And I would recommend for those of you who are interested to talk to Sekiguchi-san uh, about his slides and maybe get more detailed information. I think it's a really wonderful project. So thank you so much, Sekiguchi-san. Okay, thank for, you. Mm -hmm. Please check out. Mm -hmm. So... It's my pleasure to now introduce, okay, to introduce a living monument and <laughs> to you, uh, Professor Yojiro Kawaguchi, uh, 
who is a pioneer of Japanese media art, a life art. He was a professor at the University of Tokyo. And uh, as you can already see by his uh, kimono, he wears one of his artworks. So uh, he's going to talk about art in cosmos. And uh, please, uh, Kabuguchi-san, tell us more about your works. Mm -hmm. ah, hello. Uh, uh, fortunately, I was invited to uh, Alfred Drunker in 1986. Maybe with Sakane-san, he joined. But I'm, I'm afraid he hurt. <laughs> but anyway, uh, before more than 10 years before uh, I started computer works, uh, 1975. So this is, uh, I took a frame by frame by camera uh, on the screen. It's a directly we recorded. We did, uh, and, uh, and at the uh, Kyushu Institute of Design, now Kyushu University. Uh, but in Japan, only few computer graphic systems in Japan. Tok University of Tokyo, Kyoto, and Kyushu, uh, big, big, middle of the 1970s. Only few places we can do uh, computer graphics. Okay, next, please. And also, uh, at uh, uh, 19, 1970s, we could use only a line drawing, black and white, uh, pictures. And uh, fortunately, in uh, uh, 1980s, 1980, uh, uh, I, I joined the SIGGRAPH at uh, 1979. So, but uh, in the United States, already computer, full color computer graphics has already started. So I uh, was very surprised. In Japan, it's only black and white wireframe pictures only. So we, we, I changed my style uh, from wireframe, wireframe, black and white to color pictures. Next, please. And so, fortunately, in uh, 1980, uh, then I, uh, more, uh, we continued to develop a gross model. So, in 1981, I, uh, I, I tried to present a gross model for C-graph. So, uh, fortunately, the next year, I had a chance to present a paper. And uh, we did end, did end that, so. This uh, and lately we, we are making a 3D printer by Gross. And so lately, uh, virtual pictures in the Gross model in the uh, computer in the computer space. But lately, uh, 3D printer is very powerful for me. So we can com uh, compute. Uh, we can com uh, mix. So okay, next please. Uh, and also, uh, it's a handmade real object. <laughs> and next, please. Uh, this is handmade. I took uh, one, one year. And also, uh, at, uh, since 1983, uh, at uh, University of Osaka, Osaka University, uh, Professor Ko o Koichi Omura, he developed a Lynx-1 parallel processing machine. It's a, it's, a, it's a very big news for internationally. So it's uh, for making picture. He developed a new machine. So, I, fortunately, I used his uh, Lynx parallel machine for making gross animation. So, for making this uh, five minutes animation, it took one year. But for me, only one year <laughs> for making five minutes animation. Because uh, uh, beginning of the 80s, uh, for each frame, for rendering time, is uh, maybe uh, it took uh, one or two hours. So, you know, but, you know, for one thing, we use 30 frames. So, we are, we are a good chance to use a Lynx 1 system. The next year, ah, and uh, uh, Isao Tomita, he made a music for my, this uh, morphogenesis picture. So, but today it's too busy, <laughs> so uh, we have no time. So. So, but uh, anyway, uh, Tomita-san, he gave me a uh, music. So maybe sometime, maybe in the future. And uh, also next, please. And uh, uh, this uh, this piece, Ocean, is the uh, first time I showed, I presented at the Arts Electronica uh, here uh, before Seagraph. Uh, shortly, I want to sh show. Uh, but uh, music behind the line. Without sound? Mm -hmm. huh? 
since we are quite late with the time and the next panelists are waiting, oh, yeah. I suggest that we yeah, uh, stop maybe in two <laughs> next minutes. Next panelist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, quick one. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> okay. okay. Next speakers are waiting. <laughs> okay, so uh, hurry up. Uh, please, next, please. And also, Ah, uh, this is a, a, a cell model. We did this one, and uh, after that we developed. Ah, uh, and this one is a for, it's a new one for making a 3D printer. Uh, for this is a real 3D printing uh, object, and so also okay. So this evening, uh, uh, this tonight uh, at 11 o'clock we have a sake party also at the entrance. So more information will be uh, as an uh, exit. Uh, we can uh, you, if you want, you can take one, please. So, 11 o'clock. Uh, sake party will be uh, 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. Uh, I think that's a very good ending statement. You are all invited to the sake party at 11 o'clock. <laughs> I'm sure everyone is waking up here now. <laughs> and the information is sake cup and uh, it's uh, as an exit. So you can take. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you so much. Kawaguchi Sensei. Okay. So, um, okay. thank you everybody for attending and um, please talk to the experts here after the next panel or when you have time. So, thanks very much for everybody for all your wonderful yeah. input and showing us really the rich history of Japanese media art, which uh, I think is very, very impressive. Thank you. images. Okay, that's no problem. Okay. Your turn. Is it being projected now? No, it's not projected now. So... Oh, if you okay. can use this, then it's better. No, 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 no. They, their computer is old, so we cannot. Mm -hmm. It is no problem. Okay, so Sorry. we take out this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And we pass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Where are my microphones? Where are my microphones? Where are my microphones? Martha, you can have a seat. And where is... So it's going to be only... 20 minutes, yeah. Who do you want? Jans? Because they are not coming. <laughs> no worries. Please come to the stage. Do you? Uh huh. You can take a little longer, that's okay. When is the gala start? Well, the gala starts later. You can. But oh, okay. you can no, no, you yeah, can but take we, like we have to be at 7 7 30 yeah, and the gala. No? Yes, then we stop before 7.30. No, of course. Let's, let's say you take until 55 instead of an hour, is that okay? <laughs> Hello, Jan, have a seat. Kyoko, uh, you can come and then, yeah. Uh, we will start in a minute, so whoever wanted to join the next session, please have a seat. Uh, Ian, please, because they might sit together. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, can you go a little bit further so they can sit afterwards? Yeah, so you can sit in the middle. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us for the last session of the History Summit. And I'm sure you have so much things to talk about. But since we have very limited time, we will start right away. So the session will be about interactive art and bio art. Uh, we talked about it during our pre-meeting, whether it is still relevant to say by the categories of the media art. And we have been even panels. Can we start? <laughs> I know. This is not like the uh, formal conference. So there is a lot of stories to unfold. And I hope you can enjoy to hear what's not written on the book. And I'm glad to invite all of the panelists on the stage. And we will start with um, you know, introducing each of our panels. But since we have very limited time, we will start by seeing what they have been done and then what they are working on. So we will start with uh, Monica and Fofka.
So we probably do that together. We, I don't know, but maybe Wolfgang joins me. Um, we have a very short time, so we wanted to think about what was our connection to media art, uh, our media art projects to Ars Electronica. And what you see here is an overview of all the projects which were um, very often shown at Ars Electronica, but the most important point was when we started uh, was uh, Home of the Brain, the work which got the Golden Nika for interactive art in 92. And Home of the Brain is, is probably the first or one of the first virtual reality installations. The House of Philosophers of the Network Computer as Memory, Virtual Present Art, the philosophers Willem Flusser, the AI researcher Marvin Minsky, the AI critic Joseph Weizenbaum, the architect Paul Virilio, and we hear statements of their contradictory positions on the development of digital culture. This VR installation creates the feeling of going through their thoughts. This uh, imp uh, notion of going through their thoughts, thoughts came from Derek de Kerkhove when he saw the work he was talking about us and said it, it's the first time that you can go through the thoughts of others. He said that at, us, uh, at in Monaco at Imagina. Uh, the first who wrote really a, a lot about this work was uh, Oliver Grau in his very famous book, Virtual Art. Uh, when we came here in 92, we had five years developed uh, one of the first media labs or the first research institute in Germany, which was called uh, Art Plus Com. And uh, after, in the first years, we always sent uh, our young animation people and other people to conferences and nothing happened. And in 99, uh, in 1990, we came here and I heard Marvin Minsky talking. And I was so happy to hear somebody talking about the future of digital media art, and he was one of the four I was, or we were, cho uh, we chose for this work. Um, I think you, you get a very short introduction of the film. Um, the left off. But tone. Yeah. And you hear Willem Flusser speaking in German. Um. Was die gegenwärtige Informationsrevolution charakterisiert, ist nicht nur ein Umkodieren aus Buchstaben zu Zahlen einerseits und Bildern andererseits, sondern es ist auch eine Umschaltung des Fluxus der Informationen. Früher, wenn Sie Informationen erwerben wollten, musste sich in den öffentlichen Raum begeben. Und Leute, die etwas zu sagen haben, haben, gingen in den öffentlichen Raum, publizierten dort. Also der öffentliche Raum war der Ort, in dem Leute ausstellten, publizierten und andere hinkamen, um das dort publizierte nach auszutragen. Willem Flusser speaks about what was the, the public space in former times and that now with network computers it changes this space. in Verbindung sind, die sind, die wenden der Politik den Rücken und einander, sie wenden sich einander zu. Und das ist eine neue Struktur, die nicht mehr Politik ist, sondern eine Vernetzungsstruktur. And he talks about in 99 was this interview uh, that it will become a network structure and young people will talk to each other. Sorry, that's uh, now Paul Virilio. Maybe we, we just uh, stop it. Um, but, but if you, this film is in the archive of the um, Ars Electronica, I hope. Um, but it, it is very interesting to hear these four statements of these four very important people which we found in the, ninth, in the beginning of the 90s. But just as a notion, when we got this award, 
um, people were very unfriendly and unhappy and they thought, oh, this could be done with um, macromedia or something what was done on a disc. And uh, they didn't understand that we were interested about these networked computers. Home of the brain means it's the network, uh, the, the home of the network computers and the house of philosophers inside this environment. Okay, and uh, it, it took a long time until, especially in Germany, but also in the, many f German people were unfriendly. Um, it, was, it took a long time until it was accepted, this kind of technology, and that we did research not only as artists, but also as, scient as scientists later in a uh, the, the one of the biggest uh, research centers in Germany the, and an institute later for uh, artificial life. Oh, no, artificial intelligence, sorry. So, let's do. So, the, the next project I want to mention is Liquid Fuse. This was presented in the last uh, session of Ars Electronica's history because this liquid fuse is a work which was maybe in, shown in 30 different countries, maybe more. Um, and uh, it was not known, interactivity was not known at that time. And we had to... Um, we had to change the title from Liquid Fuse into Liquid Fuse, the virtual mirror of Narcissus, because they should get a help to understand you have to look into this mirror. Wasn't the sound? Ah, yeah. 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 And the interesting point in this work was that uh, in every different culture, in every, every different country, uh, people acted and reacted differently to this work. So, for example, um, these were film students and he was a musician. They played with it. But in, in the United States, they played and nearly destroyed the whole installation. And the... Oh, sorry. Oh, this is weg. Oh, I wanted to show you the different uh, people, but Wolfgang deleted the slide because of time shortage. Yeah, but uh, only in in Madrid, people were kissing each other, or in um, Paris, many male people said, "I'm not beautiful enough. I cannot look into it," and because we said to them, "We will uh, store the." The, um, we will save the images and then later uh, come uh, show that together. So Wolfgang will take over. Yeah. Anyway, it was the, is it on? Is it on? Yeah. It was the first work. Liquid views was for us the first work uh, we when we used uh, artificial intelligence. So the wave uh, algorithm was uh, based on a neural network. Uh, Situation, but at the time already in uh, 1999, we found out there's a lot of development uh, happened in the media arts, but it's no, you can't see it, you can't find it. It, it, it disappears very fast. So we we started to develop a sort of a media art network, but it should be also an archive on the one side, online archive, but also a platform for the uh, media art community. Uh, it's called Netzspannung.org. Here uh, on the front, on the above, you see the team of Netzspannung. And uh, the best is to... Netzspannung.org is an online archive for media art and digital culture. This. The internet platform is organized on a cross-disciplinary basis as an interface between media art, media science, and media technology. Netspannung.org is an information pool for artists, designers, scientists, and scholars. Netspannung.org presents topics from media art and research, such as cultural heritage, on teaching culture with digital media, perform and play, 
on interactive play and stage concepts, and explore information, create knowledge, on visualizing information. The area positions shows numerous video documentations of lectures given by renowned artists, scientists and scholars. Selected lecture series are recorded with the aid of a mobile streaming lab and can be transmitted live into the lecture theatres of associated colleges and universities. This networking of lecture theatres expands the possibilities of teaching on the spot and represents a first model of the classroom of the future. The area learning addresses the question of how teachers and students can be introduced to artistic work with the new media. Here, teachers can find a variety of ideas, suggestions and teaching examples showing how they can get children and young people to develop, for example, dancing scrap metal robots, a multimedia music performance or an interactive exhibition. The Digital Sparks competition provides an insight into media studies teaching at German-speaking colleges and universities. All competition entries submitted by students from the years 2001 to 2003 are archived and can be researched via an interactive map. Netspannung.org's archive contains over a thousand multimedially prepared database entries, including research projects, artistic work and interactive installations, as well as mixed reality performances, experimental formats and interactive visualizations. Media cultural artists can also help build up the archive directly. The community area is netspannung.org's open channel, where artists and designers, as well as scientists and scholars, can publish their projects themselves. In this way, their contributions become part of the archive. The archive is accessed via different interfaces. Lists are useful for tracking down particular people or projects, while graphic knowledge discovery tools, such as the semantic map or the timeline, help users to disclose new connections and content intuitively. The semantic map structures, networks and visualizes the archive's content in terms of semantic relations. It provides users with a navigational system that allows them to rummage through the database, discovering new and hidden connections. The semantic map organizes the archive into semantic clusters. The timeline sorts the content of the archive chronologically, presenting it in dynamic time axes and thereby revealing connections between different content fields. Netspannung.org is an interface for digital culture and a place for education and learning on the internet. Uh, so, uh, to put in the data or to collect the data uh, into the archive platform is one thing. And to look at it is another thing. So uh, last thing we heard about the uh, semantic map and also this was an instrument which used artificial intelligence and a neural network to, to group and to uh, organize the archive. So, and this story is, uh, also should run in cooperation with the Ars Electronica and another institute, the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute. So, but this uh, connection didn't work because Boltzmann was closed then later. And, but what we found out at that time in 2001 when we developed that, uh, we, know that uh, we knew that Google was working on the same topic and uh, we found out because you could log in in, in the user group there, we found out that our approach was much more satisfying so. And later we heard uh, Google uh, was uh, forced by the NSA to care for the semantic image search and the NSA would take over for the semantic text-based search. So we know the results. So we finish here. This could go on and on, but we are already a bit late. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, our next speaker will be Edward Koch about uh, his practice, not only by your art, but other uh, telematic pieces. Please come on the stage and... Mm -hmm. 
So our panel might be one of the, you know, diverse panel. Myself, I'm uh, from Korea, but I, I'm now in, based in New York. And we have many guests here, uh, from originally from somewhere else, but uh, based in somewhere else. So I think uh, media art in general, we are very nomadic because of the fluid, uh, you know, the uh, media we are dealing with. And Edward Koch, uh, he will talk about um, his practice, and we will come into a little bit recent history uh, from Jan and uh, Kyoko also. So when we talk about history, there is old history, but recent history. So please, Eduardo. Thank you. So we, we have just a few minutes each to provide an overview. BioArt has been in development for over 20 years. And in my own practice, having worked with telepresence in the 80s, and having pushed telepresence into the realm of the non-human, I started to get closer and closer to questions of decentering the human and searching for other modes of aesthetic experience that brought me closer to the non-human animal and to the plant world. A turning point for me was in 1997, but I don't believe that, are we seeing the images? Do we see an image of an artwork there? We do not, right? Right. All right, so <laughs> I'll just keep talking then for five minutes. So um, a turning point for me was in 1997 when I created an artwork entitled Time Capsule. Uh, in the context of this artwork, I implanted a digital microchip live on television and live on the internet and allowed remote participants to log into my own body and ret retrieve the content of this microchip. This was significant in a lot of ways for me because um, this, this microchip is encapsulated in a biocompatible glass which has effectively bonded with my own body. I still carry the microchip every 10 years. I do a live event that allows uh, the participants to retrieve the content of the microchip. And this relationship between the digital, which you now see a picture of, of the moment of the implant, uh, this relationship between the local and the remote, the living and the non-living, the robotic and the biological, the undoing of these uh, boundaries has been something that I have searched for continuously. In uh, 1998, I spent the whole year thinking, writing, and at the end of the year, I published in Leonardo a uh, manifesto called Transgenic Art, in which I was uh, more clear about the kind of bioart that I wanted to develop. What you see here is a slide of my first transgenic artwork called Genesis, which premiered at Ars Electronica in 1999. Uh, that's when I met Jens Hauser as well, who is sitting here and will be presenting. And um, those of us who have developed bioart with Marta and Jens, myself and others, um, we have been down this road for uh, about 20 years. And Genesis for me in particular was, was a, a significant uh, moment. What we have here is a encoding of a biblical statement. I created this code that allowed me to go from natural language to Morse to DNA, and then I created the bacteria using GFP and my own uh, extra biological statement, which is the biblical statement, and allowed participants to uh, cause mutation in the bacteria remotely. Next followed the second work in my creation trilogy. Genesis was the first, GFP Bunny was the second, in which I commissioned a French lab to create a GFP rabbit. And the third piece in my creation trilogy from 2001, Genesis 99, GFP Bunny 2000, and the eighth day in 2001, I also had the pleasure to see Jans in Arizona, and the only video that I have of this work, I had the privilege of having seen it produced by Jans. And we, we have GFP green glowing mice, GFP green glowing fish, 
GFP green glowing plants and GFP green glowing amoeba that live inside a biological robot which you see on the lower left corner. All of them combined created an ecology in which all living creatures were green glowing and we humans that do not glow green were the exception to that world. However, we do glow, we glow in infrared um, and that's a different conversation. Uh, and in the interest of keeping this very, very, very short, um, this does not represent my entire output in the realm of bioart, but just a few highlights. Uh, and in 2009, I completed a, a six-year uh, long project entitled Natural History of the Enigma. You see here a flower with red veins, and in the red veins of this flower, after this long uh, research uh, phase, I was able to move a piece of my own DNA that uh, under the control of a promoter expressed my, that is to say human, protein from my red veins, from my blood to the red veins of the flower. I am honored to say that Natural History of the Enigma received the Golden Nika in 2009. This is a very brief, very fast overview because we have other speakers. So I'm gonna stop here and I thank you so much for your time. Well, we will continue with uh, Marta, what she has been done uh, also in terms of bio art uh, history. So this is working. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this panel. Um, I will also say, uh, a, maybe tell a little history of what I have been doing over the last 20 years. So. I had the uh, honor and, and, and pleasure of uh, showing my graduation project here at Ars Electronica in uh, year 2000. And since then, most of my works uh, and, and my main interest has to do with identity. And this is not my slide, obviously, or not my diagram, but it does represent my methodology, and my methodology starts with uh, empathy. Not only empathy, empathy because you can um, put yourself in, in the other's position, but also because somehow you uh, resonate with whatever you're thinking about. Uh, and, and after I empathize, after I start, start with empathy on an idea, I then try to research, to come up with a hypothesis, to create a prototype and do experiments on that idea and then show it. And this is what I did with um, uh, nature. Uh, nature was the work that I um, showed here in uh, uh, year 2000, where I modified the wing pattern of live butterflies non-genetically. It's done at a specific time of the development of the butterfly and the butterflies come out asymmetrical, which tells you it is not a genetic manipulation. So I showed it for the first time here. You see on the top left-hand side the, the shape of the installation at that time. I was really young, as you can see from my picture there. Uh, and I have shown it several times until it was acquired by uh, the Mayac Museum in uh, Spain, in Badajoz, and it's now part of their collection. It was an exciting and, and um, um, eventful uh, um, experience to go from uh, a first interaction, interaction of, of the piece to uh, a full-blown, uh, uh, well-planned installation as it is uh, possible to, to set up today. Since then, I've done a lot of work in many different laboratories. I'm, I'm, I, like I said, my umbrella theme is identity. I still think that um, who we are and how we define ourselves is one of the most important things that we can do to help us define criteria, to make choices, and uh, life is about choices. And so uh, since, uh, 99, I've been working in many different laboratories around the world to create different pieces using very different techniques and very different organisms to express ideas that I empathize with and that challenge my perception of self 
and non-self. I am also married to a scientist. Uh, my husband and partner is here with me. And um, the first work that we did together was Immortality for Two. This is an image of that piece. And you can actually see that piece now down in the bunker at the, uh, in, in uh, the exhibition. Um, we've been married pretty much uh, for 20 years now. And uh, it was only about 14 years after we got married that we worked for the first time in a project. And uh, since then, we've made another one. And you will be able to see it down in the bunker as well. Immortality for two, we decided to take our uh, immune cell lines, uh, cell, uh, immune cells, uh, immune system cells, and make them into uh, immortal cell lines. And by doing this, or doing this means that you create a cancerous a cell line. So you make your cells immortal by making them into cancer cells. Uh, and this was an interesting idea for me. What do you mean when you say immortal? What it is to achieve immortality? And we did this together because who wants to be immortal alone? But actually the price of this immortalization because they're immune cells is that they are separated forever. You can, they cannot coexist in the same space. The only space where they can be together is a virtual space of the projection of the two cells, uh, cell culture flasks in the middle of the table, which you can see down in, in the bunker. The second work that we did together was inspired by the work of this gentleman that you see on the screen now. John van Root was a Dutch researcher and the father of clinical transplantation. Almost done. <laughs> and uh, and uh, following his two footsteps, he did some very important uh, uh, experiments in the 60s uh, to do with transplantation. So he found out the histocompatibility uh, rules and we decided to reject each other, molecularly, physically. And so we transplanted small portions of skin into each other's arm. This is again a, a, a repeat of experiments that were done in the 60s. And by rejecting each other, our immune systems uh, developed antibodies that will forever recognize the other. So in a sense, we gain an extra seventh sense that will forever recognize the other, remember the other, and it's a, a pact for life. So this is what I've been doing until now, and this is what I will continue on doing for the next uh, foreseeable years. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we will continue with Jan. Jan, because some, some you know, panelists prepared their talk with the visual uh, presentation, but someone didn't. Jan, could you briefly uh, talk about your past project? I only have future projects. <laughs> and I didn't prepare anything, no visual nor written, but I just brought a piece of paper from 2007 when we had the actual first session of the hybrid art category in 2007. And I brought this because it was very funny how this new category came about in 2007 where so-called bio art got the first stage at Ars Electronica in the very material sense of the term, not in the simulation or digital evocation sense of the term, but in the very materialized, rematerialized sense of the term. So I brought this just for um, improvising freely. When you ask a biologist, please come with your medium, right? He's not bringing a television. He's probably not coming with a computer either. He's probably not coming with his favorite spiritual guru. He's probably coming with a flask of liquid, which is the gross medium. And this is very interesting, and because what does it mean about the change of the very term of mediality as such? And there is a question at the Media Art Festival when it introduces a new tendency, how does it fit with previous definitions of what mediality and mediation is? And so this doesn't really fit, and we were 
and this time, and the jury sitting there and saying, what do you want to do? We felt like a kind of rest category. We had the remains of what was rejected from the other categories, right? The category was, in fact, invented because many artworks, increasingly artworks, didn't fit into any category, such as digital music, interactive, and so on. So, it was described in 2007 to say that hmm, it's about hybrid transdisciplinary projects and approaches that fuse different media and genres. And very interesting, it was a place um, for works that did not qualify as interactive as such, as digital and so on. So in, we had a look at the text by Brian Stoss together in the jury session, and it was about hybrid vigor. It was a text called From Biology to Culture, the Hybrid Metaphor. And it was about the biological origins of the term in relation to a phenomenon that had then a cultural application. So breeders appreciate hybrid vigor, increased hybrid vigor of higher capacity for growth, which is often displayed by hybrid animals and plants, increased growth size, rate, uh, size, fertility, and there was an expectation that also hybrid vigor would work in terms of a cultural category, such as a hybrid art category. So we can expect that the biological evolution would be more based on Darwinian terms. We can assume that the cultural one would be more in Lamarckian terms, even integrating also uh, a certain inheritance of acquired characteristics. But then what was funny is that with the first three awards that were actually um, presented and selected were all about biology. The first one was the Symbiotica Lab, whose speciality is tissue culture, precisely. Nobody really could link this to why this should be media art, right? And precisely because the only media is the growth medium, right? You do not do anything which is cybernetic, you do not do so anything that is dealing with the code, but there's just this very old-fashioned sense of medium as an enabling condition. So what this category forced us to is to rethink what media are today, what they have been in the past, what they are now, what they are becoming in the future. So media comes from metaxi in Greek, and the medium and so on, it was the ether, so it came from physics and chemistry, it became a term then, according to Lea Spitzer in his famous 1940s text, became a tool in sociology, and then became, of course, communication science-based definitions of media technology. And now there is this tissue culture in this flask. So we have to reinvent and rethink what medium is. And we have to go over this transformation power of what code does, what uh, translation, processing, and storing and information in media has been. And to come up with a kind of epistemological and historical investigation into what media was and what it can be in the future. And when you look today, and there's all those biohacker spaces, when you look at that the medium, that very often you have wet corners first in hacking spaces dedicated to wetware and software, and progressively having a wet corner that is integrating wetware, and this is where we are now. So I personally resist the term of bioart. Um, for this very reason, and it's not because, as you have already mentioned, <laughs> after you have seen that Eduardo and myself uh, have not any kind of personal conflict. <laughs> but for me, there is no art at all that is not biological, because it's precisely they have a biological observer. And what is very special about this so-called bio-art is that you have something that resembles yourself. You have a materiality that resembles yourself. So you're in front of a kind of co-corporeality. And this co-corporeality is a kind of doubling of yourself. So you have a kind of very different kind of proprioceptic approach to it. And the other thing is that precisely, I think that it has come over time to uh, definition of this kind of art deals with mediation via, via the instances of aliveness. So it's about the mediation of aliveness. So I like the term of biomedia quite a lot for this reason. Also because in the very beginning of media studies in the 1920s, Fritz Haider came up with this atomistic principle that all media functions are based on the atomistic principles of loosely coupled elements. And we can apply this also to biomedia art, so then the loosely coupled elements would be the cell, the atom, it would be a genetic sequence, and so forth. 
but we will have a kind of very organized atomism already because even those little elements that are organic come from organs, come from organic principles that are already organized by themselves. Why I want to say this is that uh, today we have this obsession with aliveness and both or a trifold obsession with aliveness uh, in a more literal sense that is of wet work but of course still of hard and software. And this is the reason why 2019 we have a new category here which is about artificial intelligence and life arts which is a kind of continuation of this. So in the hybridity cycle that Brian Strauss was talking about is that after a while um, hybrid art forms become purebreds again because they are in a very Latourian sense purified. So you have a label of bio art now. So maybe for the organizers here it was time to shake it again to break it up and to say, well, together, now we have a lot of fascination of computational-based artificial intelligence, whatever this means. It can mean much more than just the mimicking of human cognition. It can also just mean that we are part of a biosemiotic web where intelligence is something that is just not cognition or conscious-based. And this is, I think, what Audio Auto wanted to say with his early telematic work. <laughs> but we are in a time where soft heart and wetware are blended in a very nature way and this is something the new cycle of hybridity may start for the panel that we are going to have on Friday, Saturday when we are actually producing when we're presenting the prize winners of the first year of the art category called artificial intelligence and life arts thank you thank you so we will have a uh, panel on the list of your book and but also we have one special guest mm -hmm. you will let us see who he is and uh, we will talk about him so uh, for those who don't know who Kyoko is uh, she's originally from Japan but now she's based in here as a researcher of uh, Ars Electronica Future Lab. Thank you very much for introduction. And uh, I would like to show you the... Oh no. Um, my name is Kyoko Kuno, and uh, originally I am an artist, and uh, now I work for the Alice Electronica Future Lab since two years ago. Yeah, almost two years. And uh, so now I am a member of the Future Lab. And, and uh, today I would like to show you that my oh, almost all this work. And um, sorry, I okay. I I would like to show this way. So, um. Actually, today, uh, this is uh, one of my oldest work, and uh, I, would, I don't want to show the video today because you can see at, uh, uh, this year I have a great opportunity to show again this old work at the Open Future Lab earlier. So if you go to the, uh, the, this room, and the left side, and the, there is an the open future lab area. You can see this, my old work. Actually, this is the 2001, I made it. And uh, before that, I have the, a little more the uh, interactive work about the shadow. At that time, you remember the, uh, the almost the 90s, the, one of the hot topic is the reality, and uh, some of them, especially making the animation or um, yeah, filmmaker, 
how to make the very real computer graphics images. But uh, like uh, Titanic and uh, Toy Stories and uh, these kind of uh, famous films. And uh, at that time, I, uh, I think about the uh, photo reality is not so feel, make, uh, feel, uh, makes, feel the, uh, real, makes us the reality. So the um, question is at that time, the what is the proof of the, uh, what is the a key point of the reality? And uh, there is a something that uh, I found it, the one of the shadow. The shadow is the one of the proof of the existence. And if we without a shadow, we can't feel the, a little bit uh, strange or it's not so real. And then, after that, uh, I have the many type of the interactive work, uh, theme of the smelling and uh, sh uh, sh footprints and these kind of things. And uh, after that, sometimes the architecture asks us to, the, to make in the, uh, some, of, some of the um, the architectural project. And at first, they asked us to, the, to make in just the graphics. And, but uh, I would like to make a more interactive, uh, interactive space without the technology. And uh, this is the, uh, the underpassway, the 300 meters in, to, uh, in Nagoya, in Japan. And uh, I will make this, uh, I made this uh, underpass uh, without any kind of uh, computer, but still something uh, give, uh, something I would like to give the people who can feel the interaction. So I changed the light and uh, using the something, the moving light, with color and the, these things. And just before coming, coming to here in Linz, I also involved the, the other project about the ho children hospital. You know, the children are very scared for the uh, hospital. So um, the, one of the architecture of this project asked me to the to making the something that uh, children wants to come to the hospital. So one of I, I would like to quickly show to the one of the idea. This is a very analog interaction, but uh, I would like to make a door. The pe the children wants to open the door. Inside the, each room, there is a examine room, and uh, in the, in, uh, and uh, there is a doctor inside there. But uh, on the door, there is a kind of picture book, and uh, if uh, children wants to uh, children see the the half body of the animals. And the, like the turn of the pages, the op they open the door and the, they can see the uh, real size animals inside the room. So I think that uh, for my interest, um, it's not only the, uh, using the digital technology, but the, also, that I would like to make a kind of interaction with the analog technology as well. And so this is also the examine room. And uh, how to use the bathroom for the children. And, um, and this is the one of the research projects in the Future Lab. It, this is about uh, the, how
how people think about uh, using the time. On the wall, there is a uh, 10 different uh, rotation speed of the uh, clock hand, and uh, one is the one seconds to the one years. On and uh, around this, there is uh, so many idea for you how to use this time. Ah, okay, so so this is um, now I involve the future lab in here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So since our panel is called interactive and bioart, it's very mixed. And also I want to be more interactive. So I invited Maurice Benayun, who happened to be here together with us. Many times, Gold Nika honorary mentions in many different uh, categories of the um, media arts at Ars Electronica. So he will introduce himself a little bit for whom, you know, don't know about him. And, but he will give some interesting questions to the panelists. So let's start. Okay. Thank you, Dun. Uh, I just want to mention uh, how I was connected to uh, Ars Electronica. Uh, through uh, different works that has been awarded, uh, uh, including the uh, Quarks, that was one of the very first TV series made of computer graphics. Uh, my first work in VR, that was a big question, with uh, is God flat and is uh, devil curved. Uh, and then the work that was a golden Nika in 98, uh, World Skin, a photo safari in the land of war. So it was very important for me, uh, of course, all this period I was coming here, meeting people, discovering the work done by the other, meeting, meeting fantastic people, I have to say. Uh, it's difficult to put them together in the same place, and this is exactly what happened. Um, and, and you discover things, and you, uh, you come with new questions, maybe new answers, I'm not sure. Uh, before. Uh, saying a few more words, I just would like to do a bit of self-promotion. Tom tomorrow morning, I will spend five minutes talking about the ongoing research I'm doing uh, about transactional creation uh, based on EEG, electroencephalography, 3D printing, blockchain, and many other keywords, but uh, uh, it's mostly about finance, philosophy, uh, and poetry. So. I will talk about uh, value of values tomorrow morning during the starts panel uh, between 10 and 12. So, yes, I think it's, it was interesting to see the diversity of uh, the works you have been uh, presenting. And uh, in a way, I, uh, I have the feeling that uh, what makes your work specific and the value of your work is because you try to go as far as possible in one direction. You want to explore it. Uh, this morning, uh, or not this afternoon, uh, uh, Vukosik said uh, that uh, we, uh, we created a monster. He said. I agreed with uh, everything he said before, but not with that. I, I have the feeling that we have been parasites, parasites uh, in the monster. And you can see this here. This doesn't look like a real company making business. No, this is not what we are doing. We are a virus. Artists are viruses. And uh, what is interesting in recent research, researchers, it seems that a virus could have created consciousness in the human brain. So maybe technology is at the beginning an empty shell, and artists are bringing consciousness in this empty shell. So I would like, I would like for each of you to say uh, in a few words, uh, what is for you the ultimate achievement in your direction of research? What would it be? Okay, we so start from we're not following one order. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you want to start? Or well, <laughs> Maurice is a good friend, and I <laughs> love him, and I respect him dearly, but 
because we have a question that, is, that does not follow that we have an answer. So, um, I, and it has been said before that research is exactly uh, the name you give to that which you don't know when you're doing it. I, I don't know what the ultimate is. Uh, it's if, if in the beginning, you know, next year I celebrate uh, 40 years um, of my trajectory as, as a practicing artist. And when I started at the age of 17, if I would tell you that, that in 40 years later I would be making an artwork in outer space as I did a couple of years ago, that would be, that would be foolish. You, you, one thing leads to another. You develop, you invent your vocabulary as, as, as you go, and you know that because you're an artist yourself. So I don't think I, don't think I can answer that really, truly. I don't think I can answer that. Either, I think I am always looking for the best question to make. So I, it's not that I have, I don't think the best question will ever arrive and I'm not particularly hopeful that it will. I just want to make better questions. It surprises me that you mentioned that there's a virus that in, in, in induces consciousness. That was it? Can, can you just, I mean... It seemed, it seemed that the viruses, a virus, would have created in our DNA the element that made consciousness possible. So it's interesting to see the parasite that becomes, uh, becomes uh, what brings maybe intelligence to people. We had this question, I think, a lot in our jury as well, because there's doubt that intelligence is linked to consciousness. And there can be very in intelligent systems out there, and they're not necessarily a kind of mimicking of human cognition. I guess we can have a... You're the expert in the field, so I'm not, I'm not trying to discuss this. Uh, but, but I guess it can exist in animal consciousness, which is not mimicking human consciousness. What I feel that this, including your practice, again, and linking also what Eduardo has been bringing in Genesis, for me are crucial works that have been creating media self-awareness and a kind of virus in that sense that you cannot look at an object as a result, as an aesthetic experience without questioning the, the media that are producing it. So we are... Uh, having a kind of media archaeological puzzles in a way that we got the awareness that we always, like uh, Quitler said, need to screw up our computers in order to understand the world. So not looking at results but at processes and the material process, processes that make these processes possible. I'm, through the connection to aliveness, through this festival, very much thankful to this gathering because it provided the possibility for the shift to actually transfer this awareness from the computational, from the hard and software side to the wetware, back to the wetware, and to think intelligence today as something very different, as more as a kind of biosemiotic web within which we, with our individualized uh, anthropocentrism, are messing up our environment, and then how far media art can provide us with tools to be self-reflectively investigating the tools that we're operating with. That's my not so much answer, but a comment. <laughs> okay, uh, come back to your question, Maurice. Uh, the the goal of the of the individual project, for example, in the case of semantic map, is to find out some truths. Because, for example, I don't trust art historians when they, and curators, when they try to build some, how did it say, the media systematics or so, yeah? So, and this is why we found, found it interesting in 2000, how we could employ an algorithm to group sort of 500 artistic works and then to look what comes out. And of course this algorithm or this neural network has to be trained. So what's about the, it's about also uh, on the intelligence of the trainer, for example. So and in the case of uh, liquid views, our first, inter no, not, not the first, uh, 
but first um, very aesthetic interactive work. Um, it is interesting to see how the people come into an interplay with themselves, for example. Maybe? Can add something. Yeah. Then, uh, my, um, what you said about what, what is your question for research, yeah. Uh, my question was when we started our um, institute, Art Plus Com, it was uh, that I thought we are, as artists, responsible to work with scientists to on this uh, development of the digital culture, what we said later, digital culture. But, uh, and today I think, um, even if we, for example, started very early working with two, 22 universities, with teachers and, and uh, um, Hochschule professors and professors, Uh, on new concepts for media, because there was no program, as we all know, there was no media art or, or no, no education programs in the 90s or in the end of the 80s. And we started that quite early, and I was a bit sad that it, the education process did not go on. So, so when you see today how, how the young artists, maybe I don't know enough, but the young artists do the same works again, but don't know the same, don't have the same questions, nearly have no questions or totally different questions. And that's so astonishing for me that the history of the media art is not known and that the questions they have today, for example, with all these virtual reality works, I don't understand it. Yeah. So and and I, I get uh, I I stop. I'm what Vuk said before that he will do something quite different today. That's my impression that um, we cannot go on like this. Yeah. Again and again. Yeah. Ah, sorry. So. Yes. I, yeah. The last. <laughs> the last. Yeah. Mm. What is your research goal? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, every time I, um, mm, I think about how to I engaged for the so society and using the, the technology not only for the um, new technology, but uh, also the, the analog things, and with the with the good uh, good question. So um, uh, yeah, that like that like the my. I think mm -hmm. that's a kind of um, you know generational difference also because mm -hmm. a lot of pioneering media artists they had to build the medium itself first because there was no network there was no such a technology mm -hmm. so while they were uh, having the idea to express that idea they had to come up with the technology which was not existing at all, or nobody was thinking of, those science fiction-like practice became science fact at this point. So younger generation, they don't have to build it, but even I would say how you can use it alternative way is more questionable. But as Monica was just uh, talking about, I also teach you know, sometimes at the universities, most of the younger uh, students, um, their history is after YouTube. So everything before YouTube, they don't know about it. And then a lot of pioneering media artists, they're so busy because they know, you know, they have to go further and further. And so there is nothing much online. So 
I think Ars Electronica is helping younger uh, generation to learn more about what happened already. So they are not creating the wheel. Uh, I mean, that, like, you know, they're not creating, <laughs> reinventing the wheel, but, you know, think in a different frame work perspectives. So since our you know, session is the last, I want to give you one more question. Or is there anyone from the floor who has dying questions? No? Not interactive enough? So I will give you my question. But I hope you can only who want to talk can answer. And because um, a lot of you created uh, or like think of artificial intelligence and what the machine could be in the future from very early years. And then now it is available. A lot of uh, artists are using technology, like you know, GAN, style transfer, which is more about the visual you know, perspective. But there are some other perspective of uh, algorithm. So uh, as an artist, what is your most challenge you're having now? And um, that would be the nice closing. So I don't want to have full answer, just one sentence each, and then we will close the session. Should we start with you? Because you work with the uh, technology. Yes, can try to answer a question. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I think I'm trying to find the best combination of components that connect society, as I say, philosophy, finance, politics, and try to put that together in a way that makes sense. Well, I, I just completed a 10-year-long, very challenging process which involved the creation of an artwork in outer space. That was 10 years as an artist in residence at the French Space Agency. So I think the, the renewal of this challenge would be to continue developing space art in, in, a, in a similar direction. Well, I'm um, hoping to... Um, um, uh, generate meaning to, to think of my next artwork. I, um, I think of uh, the most creative uh, body system that we have, and, uh, um, and that is the immune system. The, uh, the, the immune system creates cells that have DNA that's different from ours, and this is something that is uh, a, a challenge for me, how to make an artwork that expresses and represents this uh, uh, creative uh, um, characteristic of our body that doesn't go through our brain cells. Well, I'm not an artist. <laughs> um, you don't do anything? <laughs> um, as a researcher, my question right now is how to use a working tool I have been collecting stuff for, for the last 30 years. I have been collecting everything that has to do with green as a color, as a pigment, as a phenomenological feature, as an as a ideological tool and so on. And I have been working around a network of international greenness studies. And I will try to make this into a kind of interdisciplinary vehicle to connect positions of different research angles to pull this Trojan horse of greener studies onto the marketplace of ideas surrounded by ivory towers populated by hyper-specialized ideas. Okay, the challenge in interactive artworks for me is to create a sort of um, rules which are so open that the that interactivity seems not to be limited. So it, that interactivity opens up a space for thinking as uh, the German um, art historian A.B. Warburg called Denkraum, Space for Thinking. So that the, the interactive moment is just an, an, a door into, into a, a 
journey of the fuel, so to say. Yeah, for me the challenge is that we reflect our work from the last 25 years and write about it and, and really try to reflect, was it worth doing it? <laughs> So, um, for me, now I member of the, as the, the researcher of the Future Lab. So, I, my challenge is um, um, how to share the artistic question with the, not only the art, with not only the art, artist and the, the, not only the usual people and also the we, how can we share the industry people as well? Yeah. Great. So we heard all the challenges and next 40 years after, we want to hear their history, how they achieved that challenge. Thank you.